So, uh, any other tools that people can think of that you've used for research? Cool. So, power mapping. Um, how many of you all have done power mapping before? Okay, awesome. So, power mapping is a visualization tool. So, um, I tend to be more of a visual thinker, um, and so power maps for me are super useful. Um, because they're a great way to like take a step back and look at um, the way that power dynamics work at your university or at your college. Um, so this is uh, a Um, so, usually what people want to create within a power map, um, you want to have the resources that you have, um, the targets that you have, and the connections that you have, which like, um, fits in with resources as well. But, um, so like, let's say that, um, Rachel, do you mind if you in the US? Um, okay, so let's say that um, you wanted to create a power map uh, for New Jersey United students. Um, we would put that in the center here, and then we would be uh, trying to create, um, well, actually, let's go more specific than NJUS. Let's say that NJUS uh, wanted to take a specific campaign um, for a goal, and so we would create a power map around um, what that specific goal or campaign would be. So you would have that, and then you would make a list of all of the resources that you as an organization have. So whether that's allied organizations that you've worked with, specific staff members that you might know, media contacts, politicians that could lend support, professors that you would be able to go in and do class wraps with, um, all of the different like nuts and bolts of what you would need to go into a campaign that would fall under resources. And then you would make a list of targets. So let's say that the campaign that people were working on was um, lowering tuition within New Jersey. Um, you would want to create a list of primary targets. So who specifically has the power or the ability to lower tuition in New Jersey. And then you would want to create a list of secondary targets. So who has the power to influence the people that can actually make that specific change? Because oftentimes, the people that have the power to make specific change are not going to listen to you or you know, be willing to create that change unless they are receiving pressure from multiple points. So oftentimes, it's much easier um, to not only pressure the primary target, but to find ways to pressure secondary targets. So for example, let's say that, um, so the person that would have the power, the people that would have the power, uh, you, you want to get it as close to one specific person as possible, but sometimes that's not possible. Um, so you have to create, like, the New Jersey legislature has the power to lower tuition. Um, so your primary targets would be like the specific people that could introduce a bill and support a bill and like create a majority to pass a bill. So secondary targets would be constituents of um, those people in the legislature. And you can also sort of take it to, um, not extreme, but like to a further place and say like, well let's figure out where these legislators live and like let's figure out who like their neighbors and like um, like the communities and the churches that they're a part of, if they're like uh, if they're religious, um, so that like once we, if we need to escalate to that point, we can do that. Uh, education. Anything else? Well, what specifically within education? So, because that's still sort of a big concept. Um, so, how specifically would people be able to access? 
feminist theory within education? Women's studies Yep. So what, where in the women's studies department, where do you get sent? To what? Um, where, sorry, um, so like when you're in a class, you have to read books, so where do you go to read books or check out the books? Yeah. The library. <laughs> cool. And then, so this, you know, what you can do is you can get as specific as you want um, or, you know, figure out what resources are accessible to who because not everybody has access to Tumblr or, like, wants to be on Tumblr. And that's, like, a specific online resource. But then a library is an offline resource that is pretty, hopefully, accessible to um, so we have feminist theory. What else? There's nothing else that will really <laughs> Moral argument. Great. Okay. Moral arguments. Great. What are some specific moral arguments? So, who are our targets that we want to pressure to overthrow patriarchy? The capitalists. The capitalists, okay. <laughs> what specific capitalists or corporations or that sort of thing? Great. Uh, so there's only one color here, but one thing that I've seen people do with power maps to differentiate between resources and targets is using different colors. Because um, it can get like a little confusing, like I'm trying to just use like different lines. Um, but yeah, um, so capitalists. Um, so I would say like there are specific corporations that you know um, American Apparel um, is one. Um, they apparently just recently finally fired their CEO, um, which is great. But um, you know, like so specific corporations or people that like reproduce um, sexist media messages uh, could be a good target. Cool, capitalists. Any any other? Primary targets? Politicians. Politicians. Okay. So, capitalists and politicians, I think, would be like a good way to like start thinking about who your primary targets would be because they're not really secondary targets, but they're a good way, like a good way to sort of like zoom in on primary targets. But primary targets would be more specific people, specific corporations. Um, specific bills, um, that sort of thing. Um, so like with the moral argument, let's say that you wanted your primary target uh, to be reforming or like proposing a new bill that like is maternity leave. Um, it's equal matern uh, maternity leave and like making sure that a decent maternity leave law exists in the United States. So then your primary targets would be 
either people that have brought up those sorts of laws before, people that we know are allies, um, and like I mentioned it in speeches, when thinking of politicians and that sort of thing. And the capitalists, um, it would be people that obviously do not have a maternity law. Because there are certain companies that will, uh, there are certain companies that will already give maternity leave, but there are also a lot of companies that don't. So we would want to look and research what specific companies don't have maternity leave. Um, great, so we'll just do really quick secondary targets and then move on. So the politicians, let's say um, we were working with the maternity leave as a way to overthrow the patriarchy, and who was a politician, I'm gonna use the state, sorry for the Canadian folks, but who's a specific politician that might be willing to propose a bill on creating like a national federal standard of maternity leave? Malcare. Thomas Malcare. Okay. <laughs> Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. Okay. Elizabeth Warren. Great. Who is he? So, who are some secondary targets that we could use to pressure Elizabeth Warren? Uh, some, somebody. Or, like, uh, I guess not she, but some party folks or somebody. Mass student five. So, the next thing is charting. Um, so, um, a SWOT chart um, is it's usually something that's used for a campaign, um, but it can also be used for like outreach and research and this sort of thing. And it's sort of another way um, to go through some of the things that are talked about in power mapping, but also like get more specific. Um, so, when you're creating a SWOT chart, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats chart, you want to create a quadrant. Your strengths, your weaknesses, <coughs> opportunities, and threats. So, Let's continue thinking about uh, getting a, a national federal maternity leave law, um, and Elizabeth Warren, like getting Elizabeth Warren to propose a bill. So, what would our strengths be for trying to get Elizabeth Warren to propose a national federal maternity leave bill? So, you mentioned that there are some strong women's groups in Massachusetts, so I think that would definitely be a strength. Organized student, Organize <coughs> student presence. She is um, very much like uh, on certain issues a progressive, somebody that is sort of like trying to create a narrative around like no business as usual in Washington. Uh, somebody that like is more radical, I guess. Um, so her specific political narrative and the story that she is trying to tell within the Democratic Party. Um, also, she talked a lot about of the nation and of the Democratic Party right now. Um, like she's like a politician that people like people know the name Elizabeth Warren if they're like, at all politically engaged, I would guess. Um, name people 
recognize. Okay, great. What are some weaknesses? Her specifically or just? I would say her specifically, but also um, any weaknesses that you can think of with like a maternity leave. Being male dominated. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to put that in between weaknesses and threats. Um, so male dominated political which sort of goes back to the original reason we thought of this for the drug behavior. Um, that's actually probably a weakness is like uh, not being able to put an intersectional analysis into a federal bill. Um, probably probable lack <coughs> of intersectionality in a bill. Great. Um, so what are some opportunities that we could use to uh, leverage Elizabeth Warren specifically, or like what are specific? Um, so what I'm thinking of maybe to like get things started is like maybe we would want to get Elizabeth Warren to propose it in April during sexual assault awareness month um, because that's sort of a time that like feminism uh, seems to be a lot more in the news, and so like using those like sort of larger narratives and like those um, opportunities, you know, using Take Back the Night um, on college campuses and like, um, at least at my campus specifically, it was a time when like the uh, women's groups on campus um, would be like, have a much more visible presence. And so it would probably be a good time to try and like coordinate when to propose the bill. So, fight for 15, the fight for raising the minimum wage that's happening right now, and the way the corporations are like leveraging messaging and saying this is going to be really, really bad for small businesses, and um, they're like taking this fight, and they're also co-opting a lot of the struggle, um, both corporations and politicians, um, sort of go back to like bigger things, are like co-opting the fight for 15 by like 
passing these bills so that we'll have a minimum wage, for example, in Seattle, there will be a minimum wage in Seattle of $15 within the next four or five years. But because of inflation and like uh, other elements, it's really gonna be like the exact same minimum wage that it is right now. But because the bill got passed, um, now like a bunch of the leftists and like folks that were working on the campaign in Seattle are like declaring victory and like the fight is sort of over um, there. Uh, the one socialist that is sitting on Seattle City Council actually refused to endorse the bill, which is good. But um, so um, watered down legislation. Yep. Great. So um, yeah, you know that's um, this is a way to sort of like take when you visualize the power dynamics for a specific thing. This is a way to say like how do these power dynamics relate to each other? Where are the holes? What needs to be worked on? And so then it becomes like you can move between these and say like great, these are some of our weaknesses. So probable lack of intersectionality in the bill is a weakness. So not only do we need to reach out to Massachusetts women's groups, we also need to reach out to people working against mass incarceration. And we need to work, and we need to reach out to like um, businesses that may already have uh, maternity leave and like get something uh, like get messages from them about like. Um, what would be good to like form media talking points around um, that sort of thing. So you can like go back and forth between these two tools to be able to figure out like where your holes are and what you need to work on and that sort of thing. Um, We have level of interest. So uh, this is what what I'm working off of is a Google document. So um, if you're doing outreach and you're trying to find people on different campuses to like start building a statewide student union, for example, um, or power network or whatever. Um, this contact spreadsheet is something that you can give to people um, that they can hopefully then input names into as well. So we have first name, last name, uh, school, city, Group affiliation, so any organizing groups that they are a part of. Um, and if you're like having conversations with people and like you say, oh cool, so you're an organizer, who do you organize with? That would probably be who you would put down in the group affiliation, but you can also put down like, because oftentimes progressive organizers are involved in like five different groups. Um, so uh, you could put down like if somebody like sits on an executive committee of something or like has a specific position within an, within an organization, that's probably what you would want to put down for group affiliation. Um, so type, um, type is like um, what type of organization it is that um, they're working on, because sometimes the name is very specific, you know, students get sweatshops, that sort of thing, but like if the group affiliation was New Jersey students in the United Students, that's like, not super specific, so you would probably want to put like student unionism or like student organizing, um, education organizing. Um, nominated by is sort of just a useful way for you to figure out uh, like who is working within this spreadsheet and like who may have a lot of contacts on like a campus that you're working on. Um, because if you see that like X person nom like put in 50 different people, and then Y person only put in two people, X person is probably gonna be a person that you're gonna to wanna to talk to more and try and like 
rope into your organizing because it seems like they're probably somebody that like knows a lot of people and is like taking this really seriously. Um, issues, sort of similar to group affiliation. Um, like what issues are people working on? Like are they focused only on environmental justice? Are they focused on environmental justice, ending mass incarceration, feminism, anti-privatization work? Yeah. yeah Uh, yeah, so, uh, for example, if I wanted to create a contact spreadsheet of everybody in this room, um, then I would like write down everybody's names here, and then this part of the spreadsheet would say, everyone was nominated by Sean. And then if we wanted to get a contact spreadsheet of every single person at this conference and like use the one spreadsheet as it, then uh, what we could do is have like every facilitator at the workshop get everyone's contact information. And so then, um, like, so local campaign planning is happening right now and Eric Foreman and a couple other people are leading it. And if they got everyone's contact information, they would put it in and then it would say nominated by Eric. So the reason why I think it's useful um, is so that you can find like the people that are more well connected on specific campuses um, and might be involved in like multiple different organizations. Um, because then you can say like, cool, this person was nominated by Sean and they're involved in like the racial justice group on campus. Oh, this person was uh, nominated by Sean and they're involved in the LGBT group on campus. So they have contacts within like multiple different organizations. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Cool. Uh, so yeah, issues, uh, like I was saying, the different issues that people are working on. Um, and then the most important parts, their email, their phone number, their social media profile, if they have it. Um, more about this person, um, that can be a good way to like, take brief notes um, for like yourself and or anyone else that like is shared on the contact spreadsheet. So like it might be a good place to put like student government but also down with the radicals. Um, like um, you know this person responded to an initial email no response since. Um, so that people know like once you're in the spreadsheet like it might be worth working on these people more because they're really, really down in what's going on, um, but it might not be worth it to like try and reach out to these people because they've been super unresponsive. And that's also more about person and level of interest are related to each other because the level of interest is like a way, um, it's a way to say like the way that uh, I have been working within it is having a one which is like a top priority, somebody who is like adding people to the spreadsheet, somebody that's really, really down with the project, and somebody that you're coordinating with really closely. A 1.5, which is somebody that's like is interested in the project, but maybe is like really, really busy with other issue-based organizing on campus, and like there's somebody that can be helpful, um, or somebody that like is on the verge of being activated, somebody that you may have had like a couple conversations with, um, and you just like need to push more. Um, a two would probably be somebody that is uh, in the different organizations um, that like you're working with. Um, if you're sort of going off of the model of like creating a statewide student power uh, organized like network right now, because that's what I've been using this for. But it can also be like within a specific organization um, if you're creating a contact spreadsheet for a specific organization. Um, you can say like this, a two would be maybe an ally in another organization that has shown up to one or two meetings or events or that sort of thing. Somebody that you could hit up to come to a rally or something like that, but it's probably not gonna be doing a lot of like actual organizing. And then a three is somebody that is like, it's good to have their contact information, maybe they'll show up, maybe they won't, but like we'll keep them in the contact spreadsheet. That's sort of like the delineation um, that we've been using um, for like levels of interest. Um, but everybody has different ways of working, so like they adapt to what you will. Um, and then more about this person, and then graduation year as well. So 
so that the spreadsheet can be updated and once people graduate and like it can also give you a good idea of um, of like shit, all of the organizers on this campus are about to graduate. We need to do some more outreach to like find and freshmen and sophomores. Um, that, sort of stuff. Uh, that was a lot of information. Do people have questions? Sorry. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts or responses, things that might be missing within the spreadsheet that you can think of? In fact, I was anxious, but I was pushing myself about the like when you do a like act on the head. Yeah. You know, so always uh, easy to like write down what you plan because you can minimize the safety of the people that are participating. So, so I don't know if some people are like tips about what to do to run these kind of actions or how to uh, to keep the information safe and safe because like using Google or or the or Facebook or different messages and the security culture is like a big thing and it's something that um, so this came up, um, I'll use a specific example from the work that I've been doing in Iowa right now. Um, so on a specific campus, um, there were two organizers that like I introduced this stuff to, started talking about the project, they were really into it, and like uh, wanted to start working on their campus immediately. Um, and one thing that they asked me was, um, so should we like create an official student organization, like as a way to make some more money and that sort of thing? I caution them to say, um, I said that like you probably shouldn't create an official student organization because then if you do end up doing like civil disobedience or direct action, then like specific people are going to be like within the university database as like the people that are running this organization or like created this organization, and the legal consequences for them will probably be more severe. Um, I don't really have an answer as far as like um, using Google Docs and like Facebook and that sort of thing. And like it is, it is something that like, um, there has to be more documents to it, but yeah. Uh, I'm from Virginia. And we have like this discussion all the time because a lot of our stuff is on Google Docs and there's a lot of like sensitive information. We do a lot of power mapping and we have like conversations with allies who are more involved in the political sphere so they actually like, know information that they should give us. Um, and what we found I don't exactly remember the name of the website, um, we're still like testing it out, but there are websites that are more secure that you can use that aren't Google that will like encode um, to understand computers. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, so I think stuff like this is still doable. Also, alternatively, you could do it like um, on like Microsoft Word or a free Microsoft Word kind of a thing and just not have it online. And if you want to share it with someone, you can always like secure a PDF file and send it to them. Yeah, most of the time, I would say that like, um, like especially this sort of contact spreadsheet, like the ones that I've been using are for like trying to gather together as many people as possible. So like, not trying to find the people that would be willing to risk arrest. Um, and like, once you get to that point in a campaign and like that stage of escalation where you're like having serious conversations about risking arrest or like doing direct action or that kind of thing then yes, I would highly recommend taking as much as possible, um, taking things offline, um, or like using Tor or like encryption or like finding somebody that does know computers, does know like, and like, it is a legitimate question whether anything is safe. Um, and so take things as much offline as possible. And like, you know, the great thing about this is that like it sort of has to be done offline. Like there are ways to like create within documents, but especially if you want to use these specific visualizations, it's I don't really have a tool or like a website that you can like plug things into. And like, I don't know, it's kind of fun too. Uh, yeah, does anyone else have anything about like security culture or anything at all? Like we're sort of just
next um, section will probably be starting uh, fairly soon. Um, but does anyone have any like concluding thoughts or like questions or constructive criticism? Yeah. So like I think about this kind of stuff is like the platform itself that runs on that very damaging the environment and all those minerals that make up the surface work and all that stuff. Are there like that's not to say that the technology is wrong, it's just like the way it's being implemented right now is very problematic. Are there any, any sort of like ways to include it without being massively destructive to the environment? I have no idea. <laughs> no idea. No. <laughs> I Sign me up. Um, I think this is all new to me, and I think it's really interesting. So, like, I, I do not articulate the words now, but I, I feel like there is some issue about some people getting to get a lot of information, and that it's really take cover by accumulating like all the names, all the the thing, like knowing who this, like who are getting, who is controlling some things, and and at the same time, you know.
Ouais, c'est nice que tu sois venu. Ouais, ben. Bah, fait que t'es ici, je vais te donner de être là aussi. Ouais, ouais, ouais.
legal youth organization, and um, uh, their relationship with society in general. So uh, with this, we can establish uh, parallels with uh, contemporary student associations. Uh, so just to, so you know a bit more about my, back, my background, uh, I'm a history student at the University of Montreal here. Uh, I'm doing my master's, uh, I'm studying my master's next year. Um, and I work mainly about uh, youth companies in Venice. So uh, we'll talk about this a few times. Uh, so you'll be the first people to hear about that. So good luck with exclusive content. <laughs> uh, also, uh, I've been involved in my uh, students association in the last two years in general. I'm also doing some LGBT stuff. Um, so uh, what I say about youth in the Middle Ages, I, I know my stuff. But uh, about student, uh, the student movement, I don't necessarily. I'm just working my, with my own experiences and observations, which is why we have a debate at the end. Uh, oh, and um, for the purpose of the safe space thing, uh, just so you know, uh, I'm putting a tiny, tiny, tiny uh, violence and rape trigger. It's just I mentioned it in a sub point, so just so you don't feel wrong or anything. Um, okay. So um, before I go into uh, youth organization as such, I, I'm, I'm talking about what I mean with my youth. So um, as a cat, oh, youth has an age cat. Um, so uh, basically, uh, uh, also what's important is that when I talk about youth in the villages, I'm talking about male youth, uh, which will be obvious for obvious reasons, which we'll see rather soon. And actually, the youth organizations I work with are uh, exclusively male, so. Uh, and if I oppose you in maturity because they don't have a better word. Uh, so basically, uh, youth is, when I use it, it corresponds roughly to uh, one's 20s. So uh, it's not actually defined by age. Uh, it's not either defined by uh, legal or economic autonomy, marital status, or having children. Even though uh, then as now, most young people did not uh, have full autonomy, did not, uh, were not married yet, and did not have children. Uh, and in fact, what defined you as a category is a set of behaviors and attitudes. Uh, so basically, in the Middle Ages, uh, youth was an age of freedom from responsibilities, or perhaps uh, irresponsibility, depending on, on the view. Also, uh, understanding uh, uh, sexuality, pleasure, luxury, frivolity, fun. Uh, as such, it was associated with two special times, uh, night and festivity. Uh, so as you may have noticed, it's not that different from our own conception of, conception of you. Um, however, it was also associated for, uh, to strength and violence, especially uh, defensive strength to defend the community. Uh, and this, I think, is also something we have. Uh, you just have to look at the crew in the army or the troop train. It's still young males are roughly 20 years ago there. Um, and this brings me to uh, the point about youth and gender. Um, so, it, of course, uh, the experience of youth and age uh, is different for women and men, uh, but the relationship between uh, youth and gender is much more complex, I would say. Uh, in fact, uh, the medieval ideas of youth were either exactly identical or exactly opposite. So on the one hand, um, both young men and women were seen as irresponsible, accused of spending and abandoned, and thought as sexually insatiable. Uh, to young men and to women were in fact attributed a uh, weakness of will and reason, uh, which led to dependency or justified dependency on uh, older men, mostly uh, the father and the family. Uh, young men stand better in this patriarchal system only insofar as they are uh, destined to take class in the place of their elders and undefined future, which may or may not happen. Uh, so as a result, uh, young men and uh, women in general were excluded of politics to different battles and targeted explicitly by anti-military legislation and moralistic moral <coughs> preaching. Um, so I think, uh, especially the idea that uh, young people and women are both suspenders, I think this is very present today and uh, also used to discredit the student movement specifically. Uh, so just for the women part, uh, so there's some cliches like uh, dating a woman is you know, super costly and everything, or uh, women just don't do anything but buy dresses, uh, 
uh, which is very expensive by skirts. Um, so uh, in the same way, it can be used against uh, young people. So every time I go to my family in Quebec, we complain about young people buying Apple products at the time, which I don't, uh, and feel super rich and spoiled. And it's specifically used uh, against to uh, claim, especially when the institution comes up. So uh, the students are accused of spending on personal consumption, conspicuous consumption instead of the institution, which is credit our claims. Uh, this was very, uh, I think, uh, during the student strike in 2012, uh, this is what was behind the famous tweet by journalist uh, uh, Richard Martineau, which said, I am trying to play the game. on uh, chairs in Outremont, which is a rich neighborhood here. Five students with red squares, eating, drinking sangria, and speaking on cell phone. This is the life. So this one's to discredit student uh, moms, which is not uh, weird. Anyway, so I think this is enough for offensive stereotypes. Uh, so, although the, young, the line of young men was weak and complete, just that, like that of women in this idea, uh, on the other hand, uh, the young men were the repository of the community's strength, uh, physical strength and violence, but that is defensive, justified violence. Uh, young men were seen as active, fiery, and intense. Uh, the stats had the exact opposite of the presentation of women as weak and passive. Uh, if you join in these ideas, in, uh, the coherent system, uh, we see that uh, on the one hand we have uh, young men who are given a special destructive force uh, to defend the community against external threats, and to women a creative force through procreation uh, centered internally in the community itself. Uh, but as both are alike in their sufficient mind, this justified the monopoly of power of mature patriarchs. Uh, who did have this ideal, clear, solid mind which allowed them to grab both of these forces uh, and have power over you and women. So this a sort of intersection uh, between age and gender or uh, between patriarchy and gerontocracy. And I think this sort of works today still, perhaps even more so because uh, it would be uh, unfair to say that the Middle Ages thought that women were only a pair of ovaries which uh, is not so clear today. Uh, anyway, um, another, another interesting point is uh, that uh, demographic and economic realities were relatively similar for youth. Uh, so there is a common pattern you can identify. So uh, in the Middle, middle Ages, uh, people, young people, young men actually, are married in their late 20s. Uh, they normally are not inherited by them from their parents, which uh, if they were lucky enough to inherit anything at all, um, could lead to economic self-sufficiency. Uh, and as described by, uh, by Arnett, this also applies to youth nowadays. Uh, he describes the period between 18 and 30 years old as emerging adulthood, uh, an age of relative freedom and self-discovery. It stands between adolescence and full adulthood, uh, and neither really one or the other. So it's hard to know how much self-discovery happened to young people in the Middle Ages, but uh, they did have freedom, as we mentioned earlier. So uh, they had freedom to have sex as they liked, uh, ideally not with uh, unmarried women or married women. So prostitutes and, uh, and widows were fine. Um, so they could drink, they could uh, challenge each other in games or uh, in fights, because they liked them. Um, so what's interesting too is that this similarity of dem demographic patterns does not work necessarily in between, so uh, especially in the uh, 19th and early 20th century, this does not happen. Uh, so uh, now we come to the main subject of this discussion, uh, that is the comparison between uh, youth habits, which I will find, and student associations. So I'll divide this uh, crudely into two main discussions. So first, the potential for subverting order, and second, the uh, uh, potential for participating in or reinforcing. Uh, so in the late Middle Ages and early modern era, in most of Europe, uh, young men were often part of youth associations called uh, youth abbots. So uh, they were not uh, religious organizations, unlike what uh, the word may uh, uh, make you think. They were secular organizations of young uh, men, as defined earlier, 
uh, and they mostly organized festive activities and supervised uh, proper marriage. Um, so I'll talk principally about the urban organization, but there were similar, similar groups in their rural areas. Um, it's more, much more interesting comparison than uh, uh, medieval students, because medieval students were mostly clerks and mostly lived in, in a farm city, so did not have the same relationship with the community, which uh, modern students often have. Um, so yeah, the, the main uh, activity of youth abbeys was to organize festivities. So uh, generally social gathering, often with alcohol. Uh, some of these were planned yearly events. Uh, so they took an important role in carnival season, so January and February, uh, during the festivities of the month of May and May Day. Um, we would also take part in civic festivities, such as the uh, local patron Saints Day, or uh, to greet visiting princes. Uh, other occasions were more spontaneous, for example, uh, the way they enforced their uh, right of regard on marriage was through festive rituals, which will, I mentioned later in Shaki Bhakti, will come to that. Um, and also, uh, they would also organize uh, activities for themselves, especially when a member of the association <coughs> uh, However, this festive and inoffensive appearance has an important but variable political role. Uh, this political potential was entirely unofficial because uh, in the statutes which were controlled by the authorities, uh, we see nothing of that. Um, so, uh, for example, in Venice, uh, a company statutes were uh, overlooked by the Council of Ten. This was the most important council in the Republic, and it was in charge, among other things, of uh, uh, internal security, as if uh, you wanted to, to uh, create a student group and the CIA checked if it was right. So, um, all the same, uh, because uh, it was a permanent organization, um, it could easily receive the community's attitudes and organize popular or foster even uh, popular movements of opposition. Uh, even against local authorities, and as such, it uh, seemed to protect the community's autonomy against foreign elements. Uh, this was reinforced by uh, what we see, we've seen earlier about the attitudes toward youth, so the idea that they, they could protect uh, the community. So, uh, this, uh, uh, to give an example of Abbe, a uh, description of Turin's Abbata de Mishtolti, or Abbe of Food, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, most of the time, this abbey was rather tame, uh, but uh, in a few incidents, we see um, that the abbey played an important role over and above the city council to defend the community against various foreign elements. Uh, the first two happened in uh, 1486 and 1490, and they're related to the contested power of the Duke of Savoy in the city. So, the details, you know, don't matter. Um, so, the first incident is a fight between ducal archers and the citizens and the second, uh, basically, uh, an important ducal councillor uh, was thought to hold a uh, few young people prisoner and uh, he was pursued by a mob and had to take refuge in the house. Um, although the ducal court saw these as acts of rebellion, uh, the community felt they were only taking, taking, uh, taking up arms to defend themselves. Uh, they had no help from city authorities, uh, which were afraid of reprisal but they did get help from the Abbey of Foot. Uh, at least in the second incident, we know the Abbey was leading the community in its defense, and it may have been involved in the first two. Uh, both happened on St. John the Baptist Day, which was uh, the pat patronal holiday of the city. So um, such a, a holiday would foster um, parochial sentiments, and uh, yeah, but it was, so this may have helped uh, the conflict to develop in Place, but it was also under the care of the Abbe of Youth and of Youth in general. So uh, it had special authority in such moments. It also played uh, a defensive role against, a role against the students of the Turin University. So, as I mentioned, students by, at this time were clerks and they did not mostly come from the same city. Uh, for the, in the business of Turin, they were a negative influence and a foreign danger. Uh, they were disturbing because they 
drive a lot, and they take bits of fights. Yeah. Um, so the Abbey's response was to fight the students in the same um, fight the students in the same way. Uh, and in doing this, they were seen as defenders of the community. So uh, the clearest example happens in 1526 uh, during carnival season when um, students try to hold their own activities. Uh, the Abbe has a monopoly on the city, so it didn't like that and attacked the students. Uh, the Duke of Court and the city authorities did not appreciate, they were quite outraged, and they tried the Abbe to, for the Abbe to stop. Uh, yet the community stood, stood behind the Abbe. Um, it, it didn't help them fight the students in the first place, and uh, it remained uh, completely silent after the event. Uh, once again, the Abbe acted against the will of the city council, which thought uh, the city, uh, the university played an important role in maintaining uh, church prestige. Uh, the last event described by Barbero occurred in 1532 on the Day. Once again, a holiday, so under the jurisdiction of the of you and the Abbe. Uh, so basically, the details are not important once again, but there's a, con a conflict between groups of nobles in the cathedral, and the Duchess is forced to take a refuge in, in the Crescentar. Uh, so, as a response, the people, mobilized by the Abbe, uh, assemble in arm uh, outside the, the cathedral and support one of the two sides, and this, this resolved the conflict. Um, at this point, the Abbe had the city under its control, and it was their leader who defused the conflict. Uh, so, at, in this event, the Abbe uh, showed the full power in the future. Uh, during this period, it was a point of reference of the community, and had neither in the city council nor in uh, the ducal government. So as a permanent organization, it had the potential to rally and unite the citizens of Turin for the defense against external threat, like the, for the ducal government and for the university students, even though it was not at all uh, what it was supposed to be in the first place, which was for the citizens. Uh, on this point, I think uh, the comparison with students' associations is eliminating. Uh, in theory, uh, student groups have uh, a limited role, so they organize uh, campus life, offer activities and services, uh, represent students in limited ways, hold parties, etc. Um, so the idea that they hold parties in our social organization gives rise to the first myth I mentioned about uh, them, so that is that they, are, they would be a clique of students that uh, means in the city partying and drinking and stuff like that. So that would resemble the youth abbe. Personally, I, I was involved for two years and didn't go to a single party, so. Maybe I'm boring. Uh, so, however, since they have a uh, permanent structure, they can easily gather the students' discontent and give them uh, a shape or something positive to it. Uh, in, in general, this applies to specific student issues, uh, like what's happened with uh, the abbe of Fools. And these issues were expressed through a small core of elected student officers. Uh, however, in 2012, uh, what we saw was that provincial student organizations channel uh, general discontent against the, gen the liberal government. Uh, this is not unlike what happened in May 68 in France and probably some other events I don't know because I don't know that. So, um, uh, in both instances, uh, students were at the origin of a wider national protest movement. Uh, thus, as we see, students have uh, student associations have a clear political role. They join social movements, organize actions, hold demonstrations, and so on. Uh, this goes on to a second myth uh, I, I, I find funny about uh, student associations. So that is that they will be a refuge of Marxist, anarchist, any kind of left-wing activist. Uh, starting to start with a price about something or other. Um, both are mid, of course. I just want to mention this. Uh, but in fact, this officiously capital political tax site is officially hidden, often under imprecise labels, so, such as external affairs or under a mobilization committee, uh, and it lies in general in a fuzzy institutional situation. In Quebec, at least, uh, our most important means of action, student strike, is wholly extremely good. Not only, not only is it outside the law, as we saw in 2012, with injunctions and even conviction of uh, the Laval History Association, 
uh, but the associations themselves are not very clear about what seems to be the most important decision they can take. Uh, the charter of this, the, the Balistri Association that was convicted says exactly nothing about strikes. Uh, I look at a few association statutes at the University, University of Montreal. Uh, so in law and philosophy, there is nothing about strikes. Uh, in economics and politics and in architecture, uh, it's only mentioned as a power of the General Assembly, so no more detail than that. In my own history association, uh, it was, until recently, it was only mentioned in one article of referenda. Uh, so, we had measures of taking referenda for strikes, but no measures to take strikes in the first place, if that makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, refer reference to play, so it's clearer, but we have the definition of strike and how we can take them, but it's probably illegal or potentially illegal. Um, so, despite this lack of official definition and the informal character of strikes, uh, the fact remains that the political role of student associations uh, is framed by the possibility of a strike and this decisively forms their image and function. So, uh, in a way, the, the two myth, uh, myths I mentioned um, participate in that and that's a popular perception that they have. So, so um, as such, both you have and the student organizations follow a similar schema. Uh, so we have an organism destined to group you and to rep represent young people in charge of uh, organization, the organization of joyful or uh, festive activities for its members, but it also expresses uh, and organizes protests because it's structured and permanent, because after all, no one else will. So uh, what we see is that uh, when an institution groups you, it can easily be festive and political at the same time and be meaningful of that. It's obviously not a direct heritage. Uh, I think uh, tra tra trajectories are opposite. So um, as I understand, student groups start more as political then become more social. And the reverse is true. So you have a start as social and become political as the result of <coughs> But uh, it works from um, mentality and cultural practice, which are quick to join new uh, defensive protests and festivity. And perhaps, interestingly, more protests and festivity as such. Um, so the open display uh, festive character of both medieval youth abbeys and our students' association is not that far away from their political protest activity. Uh, just to clarify here, by festivity, I mean a um, uh, festive spirit characterized by collective joy, uh, and during the chosen moments which are more or less taken out of normal time. Uh, by protest, I mean all forms of discourses or actions expressing opposition to a given situation, be it political, social, economic, or other. Uh, so, in fact, protest as such is often fisted itself. By, a sense, by essence, it's optimistic. Those who denounce the situation are convinced that they are right and that they can indeed change the situation. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, peasant revolts uh, generally targeted uh, royal agents, and uh, peasants thought that all that mattered was to warn the king that their agent uh, was doing something wrong, that there were abuses, that is, even though uh, the agent was normally sent by the king with specific instructions, and they were fully backed by uh, uh, the king, but you know, it's a general affair, which could be anything. This is more from facts in a democrat democratic society, yet members of social movements tend to think that they must draw the attention of the population, which is seen as sovereign in a way, uh, for any change to happen. Uh, this was uh, this is something I observed in 2012. Uh, I remember, remember that there was much interest in how opinion polls would react to the events. It was, it was thought that protest action uh, would it draw people's attention and uh, convince them that the cause was right. Uh, this did not happen in fact. Uh, it did not happen in the Middle Ages. It did not happen in 2012. Uh, but the state of mind in itself creates a uh, sort of optimism which our participants can express uh, the to register of festivity. Uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, several objects, symbols, or rituals can be equally used for festive or protest purposes. And a fire both belong to both. Uh, all of them. 
Yeah, I've heard. But, uh, <laughs> so I'm thinking here of uh, uh, maybe just bonfires or uh, more recently fireworks, uh, slogans, songs, drums, and so on. Uh, and the example I have to elaborate on is uh, the Quebec Concert de Casseroles, uh, which I don't know how to translate. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just bad at translation when I forgot to put that translation in my text. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, many people pointed out that there was a relationship, or perhaps more an influence, of a similar demonstration in Chile and South America. But I think uh, there is, they are much in common with uh, uh, the much older ritual of Chapibati. Um, which was uh, the action of young men. I don't think it's their heritage, but uh, you know, there's the same idea of noise. And I think it's interesting anyway. Um, so in the typical Shariwaki, which was organized by uh, the youth Abe when there was one, uh, young people, in the, uh, young men, of course, because, you know, patron, uh, they would gather in, in, uh, in disguise night and run up their target's house and start making noise. So with uh, screams, sound, drums, pans, uh, horns, any other instrument, anything that's you know annoying. Uh, the ritual was normally used to punish infrac infractions uh, to collective morals, especially the remarriage of uh, widowers to young women. Uh, although the objective could be to incite fear, the participants were usually non-violent. Uh, this was not important. Uh, it, the ritual ended after several days, or when the victim paid a fine, which was uh, usually uh, drinking, uh, drinking food for you know, partying and guests elsewhere. Um, however, this standard ritual could also be used for political purposes. So, um, uh, in political shabbatim, uh, the <coughs> government officials became the targets of the ritual. Um, in fact, it seems that in the 19th century, when new values were already gone, uh, Chardinari lost in its traditional roles in certain areas, especially in France, uh, whereas the political form became much more frequent. Uh, that's even true in Quebec, uh, in well, lower Canada then, uh, because uh, political Chardinari was used as a tactic during the 1837 Patriot Revolt, uh, which is what our degree Um the effectiveness of, of Shariwaki as a form of protest was enhanced by the fact that the participants were often disguised and could, as a result, hide their identity against repression. Uh, in fact, uh, disguised and masks are often used by both on festivity and protest as well. Um, a mask allows its wear to avoid ordinary constraints or inhibitions of social life, uh, which is an important aspect of festivity, as I said, is taken out of um, so that is what uh, enables cannibalism like conversion or legitimize or makes you know, the idea of a math ball sensible for custom parties, etc. Uh, the same idea with a twist exists at Halloween, so it's also taking a lot of time, you know, children wear disguises, but there's also an implicit threat in the, the idea of trick or treat. So either you follow the rituals or you get a, you know, a trick, a punishment. Of this ritual and nothing happens. Uh, so I don't think this, even this ritual threat would make sense if the children were not this class. Uh, and this links to the uh, political potency of masks and disguises. Uh, they are often claimed as symbols by those who want to act for good despite bad laws. So, for example, they are uh, worn as a precaution by incognito superheroes, like you know, Batman. Uh, they are also claimed by, well, one is claimed by the anonymous collective and uh, other sources of freedom of speech. And as a result, the master perceived as a grave danger by the forces of law and order. This is because masks symbolize anonymity and allow their wearers to hide and escape repression. Uh, as such, uh, medieval, uh, the, sorry, masks have been the target of a regular values at least since the 15th century. So for its opponents, uh, masks uh, at this time uh, favored disorder, violence, or uh, various entities. Uh, and then it's uh, 15, uh, 1455, before proclamation, they described masked men who, uh, I quote, could not be seen or recognized, 
saying very upsetting words, committing very upsetting acts, and shouting. Uh, so this decision uh, banned all sorts of disguises on pain of losing the disguise itself, uh, 200 pounds, which was you know, quite a lot. Um, I don't see this amount of money very often. Uh, but, you know, so, um, and also two months in prison, uh, which you know, a prison sentence is quite exceptional. It goes against uh, what Michel Foucault said in this funny, I'm very proud, proud to have uh, contra contradicted uh, Michel Foucault. <laughs> <laughs> So in England, in 1511, uh, there's a similar act. So it denounces a uh, mass plan to go around town and to follow murders, felony rapes, and other great sufferings and inconvenience. So oh, I didn't remember that was one right here and there's one later for my trip. Anyway, um, in addition to avoiding surveillance on their own person, mass wearer, wearers could escape their role uh, in medieval society. Everyone's rank, everyone's place in society. Uh, must be immediately obvious and uh, visible through clothing. Uh, therefore, moths allowed uh, rights of inversion or for people who don't like them in the confusion of rank. Uh, for the enemies of moth uh, even an honorable man could practice vice when his face was hidden, while uh, vile, vile peasants could mock their superiors uh, when nobody could recognize. Uh, similar but quite different also fears uh, exist in the 21st century as uh, recent uh, legends in France, in the UK, and in other countries demonstrate. Um, but as I said, it's different, we take a different form. Uh, in Montreal, uh, we have the infamous uh, P6 bylaw, which came into action during these two strikes. But uh, people in Montreal already know about this, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, so instead, I'll talk about uh, Federal Canadian Bill C-309. Uh, it's also more appropriate because it's just a mask, and there's nothing else, just a mask. Um, whereas B states has other measures. Um, so the C-309 was also a conservative Blake, uh, MP Blake Richards in October 2011, and it became law uh, last year, actually a year ago. Um, it forbids uh, people to wear a, hood, a mask or other disguise to conceal their identity without lock cues. That is only during riots and unlawful assemblies. So, following life's destruction of this, I don't want to know. I don't care about the legal definition of this. I don't, you know, the ideology behind it. So, life's definition of unlawful assemblies and riots is uh, these occur when uh, citizens on the street of their own city have re reasonable grounds to be afraid. So uh, this uh, legislation does not actually ban uh, mass during lawful demonstrations. But, you know, it's fun anyway, and it will serve as the, the, the debate in Parliament will serve as, serve as a case study to see uh, anti-mass discourses today. Uh, and I'm almost off topic, but I think this is fine and fun. Uh, uh, so yeah, so Bill C-309, uh, oh, also one important point to mention, uh, Blake Richards himself and many other in, uh, people who intervened in Parliament are retired police officers. Um, so, Bill C-209 was an offer to do Vancouver standing cop fires in June 2011. Uh, in fact, most people who intervened were from BC. Uh, but it also altered the G20 protest in Toronto the year before, and it was fed by the Quebec student strikes while the bill was moving on. Um, so, yeah, now we see some anti mass courses. I'm quoting people, I'm not talking about, I'm not saying any of this. Don't quote me. So, for Richards, uh, riots, I quote, often begin as peaceful demonstrations of one type or the other and end up being escalated by mass criminals who are hiding in plain sight. So, his supporters claim that the well targets losers who use the disorder as pretext to, I quote, wreck havoc on the city but most specifically uh, so-called anarchists, who are defined by Richards as, I quote, those individuals who come to protest with a committed intent to use the assembly as a cover for their criminal behavior. And in fact, the language uh, used revealed the fear of anarchist organizations only waiting for an occasion to lose and unleash violence. So for example, uh, many of the people wearing masks and facial coverings 
for part of organized groups with coordinated intent on confronting the police and causing mayhem. That would be their sole objective, according to uh, uh, Tory MP uh, Robert Cohen. And uh, I continue to quote, who can prepare with complete toolkits. So to fight anarchy, <coughs> uh, there is no alternative. Mask must, must, must be banned. So uh, with the C309, uh, police will proceed to, I, I'm sorry to quote this, but preempted arrests and further uh, prevent further developments. Because uh, I quote, uh, in preventing people from being disguised, disguised in those kinds of situations, we may be able to prevent those kinds of situations from ever occurring. So according to uh, people who support the bill, uh, it does not inhibit tribes and assembly because uh, the bill should protect I could, uh, individuals who are looking to be part of a peaceful protest because it will, be, uh, it will prevent those who want to infiltrate uh, to, to uh, engage in criminal activity. So uh, the bill would prevent the generation of protests into riot which would stop the demonstration as police intervene. So here, the carnivalous danger or the global social threat of the medieval mosque seems to try to transfer directly on the political scene. <coughs> the mosque is the instrument of anarchists. Um, so this association between mosque and disorder and anarchy uh, has passed into lexicon in French. Um, so chienne, which is an old word related to mosques and masquerades and carnival, uh, come to denote pejoratively disorder and chaos, uh, especially in uh, the most famous word in May 68. So, la reforme oui, la chienne non. Reform yes, uh, chienne no. At the same time, by characterizing them as looters, uh, supporters of the bill uh, and of order, assimilate political opponents that to common criminal delinquents, which, uh, which discredits their protest and makes their message apolitical or sub political. This is a pro uh, process described by Foucault in Discipline and Punish, so for once he's right. Uh, well, he's right for long time, but... <laughs> so, uh, in practice, neither medieval urban oligarchies nor the conservative government had much to fear from Musk himself, or even from what they represent. So, uh, they represent in both cases the, the, the destruction of order, so either social or... So, but in reality, um, mask bands were unused and basically unusable in the Middle Ages. Uh, the laws were re proclaimed every few years, uh, which shows they probably did not work. Uh, and in fact, masks, masks were everywhere. As for C309, it's redundant with already existing legislation. So, uh, participating in a riot is illegal, obviously. And wearing a mask during when committing a crime is illegal as well. So it's all the bill does, so I don't understand. But they did it anyway. Um, so in fact, through these laws, uh, medieval cities and modern governments seek less to silence directly opponents than to answer, spheres, uh, to answer fears of disorder and affirm in front of their own supporters that they are um, achieving the regenerative victory of order on mass and chaos. Uh, this chaos being constructed discursively by anti-mass discourses. So, yeah, I think this is fun. Uh, oh, so I talked a lot about the various ways in which youth organizations and festivity uh, could challenge the established order, but this would be a partial view, I think. Uh, no one wanted to give shape to popular dissent by creating and supporting uh, such institutions. Uh, if youth abbeys only existed to allow the expression of dissent, um, nobody would have supported them, which, you know, happened in fact. Um, even in the case of Turin, the, the youth, uh, the abbey of food was actually created or uh, made into something meaningful by the city council in the first place of the government. I think this was the prince in the country. Anyway, so, in fact, the events I've described about the Abbey of Fool were exceptional. Um, you can find it was very tame and, you know, it was easy. In fact, one of the fundamental functions of these abbeys was to control the juvenile violence, and as such, they were instruments of the city government in this objective. Um, the violence was an important aspect of medieval social relations. Uh, it was uh, especially so for young men, 
um, in the way I said earlier, so the fact that we're associated with strength and violence. Um, and it was really a fundamental part of the sociability of young men, but to defend their honor and masculinity in public. So they would often assemble in informal groups and attend various violent feats of, uh, of uh, masculinity. So that could range from group breaks uh, to ambushes against city guards. Obviously, in that time, you couldn't win against city guards. Today, I wouldn't advise it. Um, uh, yeah. So by assembling all young men into organizations, the city elders and councillors would interact directly with their official leader and uh, negotiate to limit uh, juvenile violence. As one imagines, it's easier to strike a deal with one abbey of youth than with various informal groups of young men. In exchange for this, uh, the abbeys uh, received the right to collect various dues related to their role in supervising marriage and festivities. So for example, in addition to the kinds collected through Chavivari, they could, uh, in some cities, uh, receive sums on every marriage, or uh, they could have the right to collect fines uh, for infractions committed uh, during holidays. But collaboration could go even further, as we will see first uh, with the case of the Zan Abbey de l'Enfant, or Abbey of Noble Children, which is studied by La Catalina. Uh, so this is the first half of the 15th, 16th century. So uh, the Noble Enfants were indeed noble for the most part, and they came from important families, uh, mostly those in the city council. And many Noble Enfants would later uh, take part in city government. Uh, here, here the Abbey was in some ways the marching wing of the city council. Uh, in the first period, the city of Lausanne was trying to obtain its political autonomy from the bishop. Uh, as a consequence, we see the Noble Enfants um, uh, commit acts of violence against the local clergy. Um, but despite the, the bishop's protest, the Noble Enfants are backed by the city council. Uh, later in 1536, uh, uh, Lausanne raised an army and the two leaders of the were members of the Lama uh, uh, they, they raised an army, but they lost. They were actually conquered by a protestant firm, uh, which what leads to um, the second period under uh, the overlordship of the city of Bern. So now the city council wants to moderate the application, the application of protestant ethics, which are forced upon them. And the Abbe are now revealed as fervent Catholics, so fighting the austerity forced upon them by coerced reformation. Uh, in uh, 1541, they attacked the preacher with, um, and denounced the city's morals. Uh, a bit later, uh, the consistory tried to prosecute uh, two prostitutes, and the abbey called in the population, just like the, the abbey of Fools did, and had them both free. So uh, despite orders from Bern, uh, the city council did nothing to punish its young men. Uh, but uh, it, the city of Bern acted to mean directly and basically wiped out the Abbey in 1544. Uh, 1544, sorry. Um, and this was an important step in implementing the reform in the city. Uh, quickly after, the city council was as zealously protestant as, this, as it had been Catholic before. And actually, the Spanish Milton Fond, which fought the protestant reformation, are part of the city council and now. Protestant, in a way. So obviously, in, in this case, we see there are still a, a clear protest role against something external, but this is uh, placed under the will of the elite and city government, which wasn't the case in Turin. Um, but perhaps an even clearer example is uh, that of the Venetian Compagnie de la Carta, uh, which uh, yeah, it's a great place of uh, uh, extreme collaboration between government and institutionalized youth. Um, once again, it's clear we indicted, they're clearly, clearly identified with the elite, um, which is here a uh, strongly defined and very strictly as we define a uh, political caste. Um, so all members of these associations were member of the noble class in Venice, which all participated in political activity, um, and no one else. Um, so collaboration between government and you. Uh, was very strong. On the one hand, the Republic could allow uh, young men to use state property uh, for their activities. 
So um, for example, if they were uh, borrow uh, the, the chambers of the Ducal Palace to hold uh, balls or dances, or you could even use the Dutch's ceremonial galley or various naval vessels, or they could even request subsidies to organize uh, festivities. On the other hand, uh, youth companies played uh, an auxiliary role in the government's political projects. Uh, this was most obvious uh, during the Italian wars in the early 1500s, uh, when they accepted mercenaries and foreign princes in their ranks to uh, strengthen the, these partners' relationship with the Republic. So by following their elders' orders, uh, they would simultaneously further their city's project, guarantee access to more resources for uh, their company, and show their personal loyalty to, to the state. Uh, and in a way, and perhaps paradoxically, the same dynamic can apply to student leaders on the local level. And this is something I experienced uh, personally when I was uh, on the uh, Department of Assembly uh, for the last two years. So to give some background on, on this, uh, in the history uh, department at UDM, we have a separate association for, for grad and non-grad students. And undergrad students, uh, especially seniors who are more, more influential in the association, uh, and especially you know, only seniors in my experience are ever been secretary general. So uh, seniors are generally uh, aspiring to continue in the department uh, uh, for grad students. So uh, they have a, a clear advantage to maintaining good relationships, both with individual faculty or with the department in general. Um, this is compounded by the fact that as frequent in the locations uh, with uh, the department, the association and its representative tend to aspire to maintain a good, good link, good talk with department heads and faculty. Um, so uh, as such, a uh, student representation on the departmental level is done by individ individuals with a pure personal advantage to maintaining uh, sunny relationships as opposed to representing the suit. So there's a conflict of interest here. Uh, as far as I know, it never caused any problem in my association, but I'm obviously biased, uh, and I won't put myself, myself above this. Uh, this also works at the level of student federations. Um, so as we can interlocutor with college executives, a student representative at higher levels have good reasons to maintain good relationships, good long-term relationships. Um, this caused some, uh, some uh, friction at the University of Montreal uh, when uh, our federation uh, took a mandate to uh, fight for our rector's resignation, which is obviously antagonistic. Uh, and this was more or less not applied in any way. I don't think they did anything for that. Um, and many associations were quite unhappy of the result. Um, I would say I'm not enough of a pessimist to say that uh, student leaders systematically betray those who elected them, but uh, the institutionalized student movement may not be a political or radical student critique of what happens on campus in academia, uh, in the case of academia, especially when uh, students are cultured to uh, this new year as far as, as they, their studies go along. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, practical collaboration can, is only part of the picture. Youth organizations often uh, function with reference to mature or more general political associations, and they're thought as propagutic to put adult political life. Basically, the organizations are uh, understood as if they are, or perhaps should be, a miniature version of the state itself, and should prepare uh, their members to mature political life. Um, as such, it's seen as very important that they be comfortable in practice uh, to state government. This is very clear in Venice, that's exactly what I said, miniature version of the republic. Uh, um, in fact, the companies themselves model their way of uh, functioning on the Venetian state. So uh, they would take collective decisions with uh, voting laws, which was the practice in Venice. Um, the group was increasingly close and exclusive, uh, close to cooptation, which was also going on in the nobility in general in Venice. 
uh, power was shared at different levels between uh, the General Assembly, uh, elected officials, and the single tribe. Um, and in fact, the relationship between all of these levels uh, resembles that uh, that existed in the nation state. Um, so for example, the relationship between the prior and the officers is like that of the Dodge and uh, various institutions of the Republic. The prior is valorized uh, through distinctive superior dress, uh, but cannot act alone without approval from his officers, which was the practice in Venice. This reflects not only the practical way of functioning of Venice, but also the ideology uh, that uh, sustained this practice, uh, that is the ideology of the myth, the state. Uh, this myth argued that Venice had the perfect government because it uh, used and incorporated perfectly all of Aristotle's uh, types of government, that is, popular government, aristocracy, and monarchy. In the case of the student, uh, you know, and the companies, so we have uh, the assembly, which is popular government once again, uh, aristocracy, the elected officials, and monarchy, the power. So uh, functioning like a smaller republic was convenient in some ways, uh, although a noble could participate in uh, the Great Council, uh, even at a relatively young age, so from, you can enter at, as early as 20 and we're all in it at 25. Uh, despite this, their rights were limited on it until 30 or thereabouts. Um, they could, would only occupy very minor or undesirable positions until they were much older. Uh, through the youth companies, um, they learned in some basic ways how their, how their own system worked and partook in the state's ideology without actually uh, taking part or uh, participating in the central political processes which are monopolized by their uh, by their parties. Uh, the contemporary student movement is quite different, uh, and not only in terms of the underlying ideology. I, I take it nobody here believes in the mixed state. Um, so obviously modern student society does have, uh, modern Western societies don't have a clearly defined political caste as Venice did. Uh, so there's no mandatory uh, generation pattern of relays between those who, came, who took part uh, in youth organizations and future political leaders. Uh, it's also so true that students specifically follow a number of night pub after graduation, uh, which is not what really happened to the nation back with who were forced to become to in some way. If you were elected to something and you didn't you know, apply for the job, you were just proposed. If you were elected, you had no choice but to serve or to pay a fine. Uh, anyway, but uh, the social, modern social fluidity has its limits. Uh, students are mostly part of uh, the upper middle class, just not as our positions. And although students have various potential futures, there's clearly a link between student involvement in politics. Uh, at the very least, it's seen as pertinent experience for prospective politicians. Uh, and many student leaders jump into politics uh, to the point. Uh, this was obvious uh, in the case of uh, 2012 student leaders, Martine Desjardins and Leo Bouffouin, who voted uh, uh, for prospective MPs for PQ, and in the case, even in the MP, or with uh, former uh, May 68 leader Daniel on the European Parliament. I don't know if it was elected. Um, another important difference is that uh, student associations do not actually proceed from the same ideology and practice as power as the state, uh, unlike what happened in Venice, where there are perfect differences between both. So today, modern democratic states uh, proceed from uh, an understanding of representative democracy where participation of all citizens in general elections is not uh, In my experience at uh, UDM, many associations, uh, student associations, work, work under a different mode of democracy, direct democracy, <laughs> where um, decisions are taken by members present at general assemblies. Uh, so the central difference between both understandings is on the one hand, the choice of everyone, even if they're uninformed, and yet, on the other hand, the choice of those who are present and informed, even if it's not everyone. So I don't want this to devolve into a fight about which is best. Uh, what it's, it, what's interesting to me is that uh, there's a mismatch between the understanding of democracy 
um, to the eyes of many outside the student movement, including many journalists, this would undermine the legitimacy or democratic, the democratic character of decisions taken by student associations uh, because they do not follow the understanding of democracy, which is officialized by the state. In fact, the model of the sovereign general assembly is quite common in many nonprofit organizations, and for them, even the low quorum is as difficult as getting one in my experience at, uh, in history. Yet, I've seen no one go out of their ways to say that you know, uh, the LGBT group I work with is anti democratic because they don't, they don't have the quorum, which is something that's argued against uh, in the case of student associations. To me, this points to the fact that even if they don't follow the rules of state ideologies, uh, the rules of state ideologies, student associations are um, understood with reference to them um, to a much greater degree that, than other organizations. The, the question seems to be, do they or don't they come up to the standards of democracy in the norms of understanding? This is why I think, uh, well, actually I think this is because uh, they are understood as a uh, proper duty, as a preparation to politics. And if they fail to follow the same rules as the state, uh, they fail in this and lose their legitimacy. Mm. So as a consequence, uh, they are charged negatively if they fail to achieve these set standards, even if uh, this is because they proceed from a different understanding of democracy. Uh, it's as if they were really miniature states or proper duty government or the benefit of you just failed ones as opposed to the successful ones of them. Um, so I cited a few words explicitly. If you want to take notes, you can. Um, or I skip to the conclusion slide and we we'll start to have a discussion. Yeah, so discussion. Um, yeah, it's uh, 12 15. So um, should we have like, like 15 sessions <coughs> and then go to lunch? Um, today there is like a room for everyone.
three branches, which were from the living, from the maze, the living for my maze, I said, to old maze, um, and they would give them to, uh, young men would give them to uh, the girl of their choice. Uh, and there were several similar uh, holidays elsewhere, I think in Germany and uh, England too. So this is one thing that's happening, and for reasons I absolutely do not know at all. Um, the, I think it's general, International Workers' Day was put the same day, which I find very funny because I was surprised. Um, so yeah, does it answer the question? And the other was? I was wondering how you got introduced to it, but I do have something to say about this. It makes me think that life is kind of split in between work and pleasure. And um, there's this like contrast between green and red during May Day that like symbolizes work or pleasure. But it kind of makes sense to me that way why it's not. But I, I'm so interested in how you were introduced to this. Uh, actually, I, I, on one side, I was doing my student development. Things and this happens, and I'm working on a medieval youth organization. So you make the link between both, and it wasn't something that was I didn't go into medieval youth and come to my involvement. I just linked the two, and it's just my research. I don't know how it came up, um, really. It's just these organizations are funny. Well, at some point, yes. Yeah, like we know the events. Yeah, which uh, on that I really agree. Like with the length of the year, uh, with both of it, so maybe it would be like different from like the rest of your regular invitation and your local and things like that. And I think the length of May Day is more thinking that uh, May Day that we know now was uh, organized for start. Thank you. 
is because uh, class differences exist in society, and when we students coming to a university, I mean, we normally might compose this identity of them as a university, and like we construct an idea that like this is a working class university and this is a uh, elite university, which is very true. You know, like one school is not the same as Harvard, but um, I mean, I go to a school in New York where it's uh, seen as a elite university, and it's, um, there's elite uh, fashion and art school, but I'm in a social research school, and like, I come from a very working class background, and this tuition is really expensive, and I can only go there to have a scholarship. And meanwhile, I mean, it's, it's uh, more complicated than just plain. Not everybody is here, so that was the best thing. Um, 
work in uh, a lot of the, uh, from the 16th century onwards, the uh, second half of the 16th century, most of them died. Uh, the first the Protestant Reformation killings were happening. Uh, uh, and um, also in other in Turin, it was uh, uh, deleted from everywhere, I think, uh, 1871. Uh, and it may have had something to do with the fact that it could have so much power. Um, but uh, it's not very clear what happened. In some cases, they just lose most of their power and become just festive festive organizations and they eventually die out. Well, those um, have died out. I mean, this. Well, you know, there's still like halls, like the hall, you know, social organization. Well, there are other organizations that look like them. Oh, okay. As far as I know, they did not. Oh, okay, so unrelated. Yeah, I, I the, the the closest example to this I, I know was um, in Lyon, uh, or was uh, or Dijon, I won't remember. Um, there was this, uh, this abbey, which was done by the book, mother, the crazy mother, which is probably misogynistic. Um, and uh, it was supposedly suppressed a few times, but it survived. And eventually died out. I don't know when, uh, but uh, in the I think it was in the during the, uh, the cultural front of France, uh, they revived it and had a big facility from uh, La Mercure, which means it was it was dead. By then. And my companies all died uh, after the 1560s. Um, yeah, they they don't survive very well. As far as I know, uh, none of these organizations. Uh, many medieval groups uh, did not survive anyway. Uh, we can take of guilds, which although related groups were formed later uh, in the Union movement, did actually disappear because of the liberalism. But uh, we don't see the question. Yeah. I kind of have a similar question about guilds. Uh, how related were they to guilds themselves? Uh, it depends. Uh, I'm, the, the easiest groups to study are obviously elite institutions, which is why I mostly mention elite institutions. Uh, I'm sorry for this. Um, you know, it's biased sources. Um, but um, they were not, uh, in some cities, uh, there were uh, different uh, youth abbeys or Occupational groups. So you would have the, I don't know, the Taylor's Youth Abbey and the, uh, you know, understand. Uh, and in some cities there was no such thing. It varies a lot, but they're not necessarily related to the guilds. Uh, they don't have the same functions at all. Uh, they, you know, it's the only information there is. So specific youth groups or occupational categories. And that's only in the big cities. In the rural areas, there's only one abbey in the city, well, in the town. In cities, there are more people, so there may be several abbeys with different models. But generally, the, all the abbeys are under the elite abbey. There is a debate about this. <laughs> Anything else? I'm 
out of my senses. So it was one of the sins, and it was wrong. Oh, nice. Anyway, it was very bad. You could not get money from uh, the uh, ecclesiastical benefits you had. This was very bad. It was, it was a, a great movement in, in the Middle Ages uh, with a uh, uh, growing reform. And there was a debate about university professors actually, actually accepting money to teach. And from the church's point of view, it was wrong because I think it's, I don't I know how to use this, but I think it's interesting. You should write plays. Huh? You should write plays. Um, so I came to the 
the guys from University of Ottawa in 2011, right before the student strike exploded. I had no idea what I was getting into. I mean, the people that were preparing for it didn't know what they were getting into, and then it happened and it totally changed my life, seriously. Um, I come from a revolutionary perspective. Uh, I am interested in making long-term lasting social change, uh, reversing capitalism, uh, I'm a communist. So these are the kinds of things that I want to put up front for you guys to know who I am. And I want, I'm going to I'm going to assume that we're all here for long-term social change. And I'm going to I'm going to propose my perspective of a revolutionary perspective. Um, one thing that I think is important to understand about the student movement in Quebec is that. Uh, I would say like the majority of people in uh, ASSE, which is our national student union, are anti-capitalist, but not everyone is revolutionary. Um, and so that, I'm both, and I want to put that out there so you guys can understand where I'm coming from and why I see things the way I do. Uh, I was on the student executive after the strike and I participated a little bit during the strike. Well, I participated in the strike, just like when you compare yourself to people, like uh, my comrade over here then. Anyway, levels of participation change. Um, I was definitely fully uh, involved in the strike and it changed the way that I saw the world. Um, after that, I went on the, after the student strike, there was like a wave of uh, denunciations of sexual assault that had happened during the 2012 student strike. And it's important to understand that like, anyway, there, there was collective spaces that started popping up during the student strike who were like, there's this chant that says, Aki la rue, a la rue, and it's whose streets are streets, and that is something that I've said for a long time, but I've never felt until 2012. That, those were our streets, we were there. I mean, those were ours, like, no, they were ours. <laughs> so, but, it, it's, you know, it's a human project, and they're like, we're really, we don't treat each other properly, we don't. And uh, there was a lot of sexual stuff that happened in these collective spaces. And that's something that, if we want to build these collective spaces, we have to to be able to address the sexual assault. We have to be able to address people stealing from each other. We have to be able to address physical violence. We have to be able to address these things. And if we don't, then, then we're talking. Um, it's not going to be a real lasting social change. And I think that the, it, the left is actually uh, needs this. Like the left, in order to have some kind of cohesive unity, and in, in order to be able to move forward, we need this. Um, so after this, like, I would say in November 2012, there, there started to be, like, denunciations of, uh, of sexual assault that had happened during the student strike, and uh, there was these efforts made by feminists, mostly, um, uh, who wanted to talk about this issue. Um, there was some backlash. At one point, the ASSE Congress, which is, like, uh, happens, like, maybe twice, three times a year, uh, it was entirely taken over and dedicated to that very subject, and that was through the efforts of feminist organizing and people supporting that feminist uh, initiative. Um, then, fast forward to uh, September 2013, one of <laughs> one, an organizer that you guys may or may not know, who actually went all over the states talking about was out it was denounced as a perpetrator of sexual violence and that was kind of passed through Bouchare, you know, word of mouth, um, through certain circles. And then there was someone who actually went and posted like his name and what he did on a Facebook status. And that is what we that's that's 2013 November. November. And that is what I that's kind of where I come in where uh, that really was the context where I was on the executive of, this, of, my, of my local student uh, union, and that guy had been an old executive. And after that, there was like, oh, but you did that. Oh, you, you, you're so quick to condemn him. Yeah, I know that you assaulted me when we were together. And these kinds of things were popping up on Facebook and outside of Facebook, okay? And names were being named. Names were being named. Um, that is like where that, so we have this kind of like movement, and that's where I got involved with initiatives of what, what I thought would have been interesting. I had no idea what it was about when I first said it. I was like, transformative justice, we're at this general assembly. It was the first one after the denunciations, and we're just like, can we just address this somehow so 
the initiative for transformative justice, I feel like, started around that time. And uh, it's been something that I was involved in a specific case, one specific case with one specific person. I was a member of a committee, and I'm coming to you as an individual on that committee and not on behalf of the committee in and of itself. Not everyone on the committee is, is a communist, not everyone on the committee is, you know, that's my personal perspective. Um, and so that's where I, that's why I'm doing this here. <laughs> uh, so that's where I come from. Now, before I go further, because I am going to give you guys more context from November 2013 to now, uh, I would like to just do this exercise. I don't know how many, 80% of us need to stand, so I'm going to get us to move a little bit. Because, um, I think what we want to do is break up into groups of like 10. Let's say 10. I think there's like, what, 40 people here? 20, 30? Anyway. We'll do like, try and do three, four, four groups, whatever. Try to have a group with 10 people. Try and include people that you may or may not, that you may not know. And we're gonna actually do this in the hallway. So we're just gonna like quickly into the hallway. Okay, so, 
Uh, I wanted to put it out there that that is, that is a reality for people living different kinds of sexual orientation and identities. And unfortunately, I'm not sure how to make those two come together for this presentation for you. And that's something that I can, I'm open to hearing about how to work on. Um, so yeah, um, anywhere from like two to two out of five to three out of five women are going to be experiencing sexual assault at some point in their lives. Um, when we talk about indigenous women in Canada, we're talking about like those, those stats like triple uh, are, anyways, that experience sexual violence under the age of 18, you're talking about like 60%, so we're talking about uh, marginalization and uh, what I like to talk, what I like to add is class analysis to our understanding of sexual assault. The Rape Crisis Center in Vancouver says that um, people, men, we're gonna say, uh, sexually assault from their class position down. And that would make sense if we look at the statistics of indigenous women and the assault of uh, sexual violence. Um, so when we're talking about transformative justice, I am coming at it from a class perspective. Transformative justice is an investment in someone who you want to, at least the, the perspective that I was, when I'm talking about my context, that doesn't mean that that's what everyone does, but when the context that I was coming from, it was wanting to be able to organize with this person in the future. So how are we gonna make sure that, that the survivor is able to actually organize with this person in the future? I don't know if you guys have heard about Ralph Ford, who is the who was mayor of Toronto. I have heard that he's a perpetrator. And is that, would, would if, if I was in the position of having survived violence from him, I don't know what I would do, but I think that the idea around transformative justice is necessarily an investment in the person who committed the violence. And so you have to understand, me personally, I am not going to be doing transformative justice with someone who's my class enemy, right? But that depends on the person. That's something that I take into consideration, and I think that that's why I said the left earlier, because you, it's, it's a commitment, right? <clears throat> Like transformative justice, we're trying to think of a collective way to be accountable to the violence that people are, are, are experiencing, right? We're trying to merge the systemic and the individual, and that effort needs to be worth it, right? And some people, the amount of effort that's gonna take is not worth the result that you're gonna get. And that's a decision that you have to make and be aware of from the beginning. Okay, uh, what is revolution? Revolution to me is, a complete overturning of social and economic structures, the system that exists, right? So, um, and why is revolution important? Because we live in a uh, exploitative society. Um, so those are my definitions of revolution and um, you know, our, our society is based on class system. That is, uh, that is stratified like oppression to the point where like it, there's just, uh, it's on a global scale where people are like extremely oppressed and the, the small group of rich people and then, yeah. Um, so yeah, going back to the context of what happened. Um, yeah, so the student movement, there was these, uh, what, well, the elements I think that was really hard for people to take was the, was the um, going on Facebook and saying people's names. So they were kind of like two hot topics. It was like saying someone's name, naming the person, the power that you can get from naming that person. Um, and the reaction, because they, with two, at least two of the denunciations that had happened, the people that had committed the violence um, were confronted before it became public and before that violence was recognized and that responsibility was taken. And then when the name was said in public, it, they went back and they're like, oh, you know? So there was, there was a, so the power that you hold in, putting the stakes up, right? Because if you survive that, like, I, as a communist, I believe that there is objective truth, and I also believe that you have a truth, right? So when you speak your truth, it can be in a relationship to something that's more objective. When, when like, for example, for me, I, as someone who is on this committee, I'm seeing, like, this dichotomy, right, between, like, people that are close to the aggressor and people that are close to the survivor, right? And that dichotomy isn't necessarily real, like it's not necessarily objective, but that is my truth and that's where I'm coming from when I speak that. And so, the, when you're talking about 
denunciations and what the power that the power that that has when you're talking about violence and someone who has experienced violence and part of the violence is remaining silent. Like that is not separate from the violence. That is part of the violence. The last step of genocide is denying that it existed. That is part of the genocidal process. Like silence is often used as as integral as part of the violence. So breaking that silence is actually having that truth and speaking speaking that truth and being able, whether or not it's like 100% objective as opposed to someone else who sees that person and knows that person as their brother, their friend, their, their, the, uh, the perpetrator as someone who they love and who they honor and who has all these great qualities, speaking that truth holds power, especially when you're saying it in public and especially when um, Especially when you are uh, when you when you're when you're expected to be silent, right? Um, okay. So the uh, Student Association for Human Sciences uh, voted in a general assembly that they were going to support feminist initiatives on uh, transformative justice. After that, there was multiple committees that were struck up um, to address the uh, slew of uh, denunciations. A better word. That's not a, that's, that's a better word. Accusations. Accusations. Thank you. Um, the accusations that have been put out. The problem I have with accusations is that it implies that it's uh, like you know, there's like a reason to um, which became an issue also. So one thing. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep it to my. So. Uh, yeah, so there's a committee that was set up for a particular case. I was part of that committee. Um, we tried to uh, contact the perpetrator who um, had started to refuse that. Uh, he's like, I know I did something wrong, but it was a sexual assault, right? And that kind of, so then there's like efforts put out. There's like, okay, we, we, we research what is transformative justice. Like there's tons, especially for people who are coming from the States, you guys, so many resources, like look it up. That's where we got our direction from. Transformative justice is not like, like there is really important things. Um, I'm just gonna go over some of our principles because I think it's important to understand what this is all about. This is all in French. I know there's a lot of French ones here right now. So that's why I have this. This is the text that the committee put out. I'm translating it right now, it's not done. If you guys want the English version, uh, I can email it to you. One, the first principle is belief in the survivor. Why is that important? Well, because transformative justice is uh, is not a tribunal, right? It's like we are we are coming from this place where we're taking it for granted that this thing happened. Why do we do that? And people really struggle with that first principle. It's hard. Like, why am I just going to take this person for granted when you're accusing my turn of having assaulted someone? And that, if you guys want to go, if you guys are trying to do this in your life, which I would really encourage, um, that is going to happen. Expect that. Okay. The principle of believing my my. There's no. It's hard to be absolute, especially as a revolutionary, when we know that we're, not, we're like there's constant potential attacks from the state uh, that can happen at any time. It's hard to speak in absolutes of like, you always have to believe the survivor. My, my rule of thumb is if you don't have a fucking good reason to doubt the survivor, then you don't. Like you have to have a damn good reason. Like a really, really good reason. And if you don't have a good reason, you are gonna believe. And why do we do that? Because we exist in a context and we are not neutral. This isn't the tribunal that you go to, uh, at, like when you, when you go to court. It's not like this guy, this person's opinion versus this person's opinion, and these two people have like equal standing, and we're gonna weigh. It doesn't start as equal, right? It starts like this. So what a survivor is putting at risk by breaking that silence is also their safety. That's something that has to be understood. Breaking the silence is putting that safety. So for the survivor to break that silence is a lot more risky, and for them to be lying is like, almost not logical, because they're putting a lot at risk by saying that. And that, that principle can also be translated to a lot of different situations where racism, homophobia, transphobia, these kinds of situations exist. So when you hear someone calling it out, um, that silence is, is, a, is, is hard to break. It takes a lot of courage, and they're putting a lot on the line, right? So that's part of the principle of why we believe. That's the first principle, and that was definitely one of the most controversial, for sure. 
So we can take that for granted here, but that's it's tricky, it's tough. It's tough when it's human. You know, it's easy to say when it's not you, but it's tough when it's you. So that's why we am giving you a heads up. Um, the second step that we did was kind of like, we recognize that patriarchy exists, uh, race culture, um, culture of silence. So we're just trying to like, this. we live in a sexist society, and like we are acknowledging that that exists, right? So that's our second principle. Third one was, um, um, yeah, so the, the sharing of spaces, often uh, people, especially people who have lived uh, the violence are going to exclude themselves. So women will tend to exclude themselves from organizing spaces. Often perpetrators, unfortunately, are people that have contributed in like, an amazing way, especially within activist circles, but elsewhere, you know. Um, there are people that have put in time and effort and dedication to great projects that people necessarily going to trust. That's why, why, you know what I mean? Like when you see someone who's putting in the work, you feel like they're a comrade. Comrade is special, that's a special relationship. And that's a level of trust that's hard, you know? Uh, that's hard to, that, anyway, I think as an activist, you have these uh, elements that there's a specificity to doing this in an activist circle. Uh, just like there's a specificity to do it in like a non-status community. Yeah, actually speaking about I mean, how we have a hard time, almost imagining it is happening so like multiple times. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering like I had an experience in the Maple Spring, those situations of violence were usually the state perpetrating it onto us and our comrades. So to imagine those safe spaces of like we walked the streets at night every single night, and whoever was walking next to him, there was this unspoken bond of like, I didn't turn into you, you don't protect me. So to imagine that broken is terrifying. So how much of this happened because you seem to be saying it was a common thing, or? So right after the strike, there's at least like, I think there's like two, three people at least that were out, like that were called as being like, people, perpetrators of violence, people who insulted. And then I know for sure in November, study with one, two, three, four, five. Since then, there's been like, since then, every two months now, there's like something on Facebook. There's actually a like personality created that's called Alerta Feminista that people have periodically been sending these, uh, these announcements to. Yeah, and I just like to add that like it's not just the Maple Spring, right? Like this happens in most activist spaces, and because of that culture of silence, it's never talked about. And and the Maple Spring, I think, is a, is a unique. Like I think you folks have done a, a good job of actually addressing it, whether or not like we can talk about <laughs> if it's actually some sort of prevention going on. But but it does happen, and there is a culture of silence, which is why it is so surprising to hear about uh, the frequency. I think that one thing that's important also to uh, underline is that all those denunciations or uh, accusations, uh, it tends to uh, encourage like, other people to denunciate. So maybe like, that's why it seems like there were a lot, like one after the other, but it doesn't mean that all of like, the, the aggressions took place at the same time. Like, some of them were oh, yeah. like, really old, but that- Yeah, some of them were from a year ago. Like a year ago, this guy did this, you know? Um, like, it's crazy, like, we, you know, uh, anyways, there's, there's like, a, I think communists have rightfully so got blocked by this idea of, like, being a vanguard and, like, here's the elite, like, here's the enlightenment that are coming to give the knowledge to the masses, which is really fucked up, you know, like, it's a messed up way to think. Um, but, on the other hand, then you have, like, and then I'm exposed to anarchist circles who are, like, thinking that like sexual assault doesn't affect them like everybody else you know like come on like we are living in this our we're hand, we're in it like we're dirty the only like what's different is that we actually had here uh, a critical mass of feminists and honestly i don't know how i don't know how we would have done with that straight up and i give so many props to people that do this kind of work without a critical mass of feminists because that is tough it's, it's tough it's tough like as this is and Anyway, when the denunciation started happening, there was like other feminists from different spaces that were like, oh, that guy, he just got denounced as a, like, a perpetrator. We don't want him. And there was people that were independently excluding people from spaces. And that 
help to create, and this is what I want to get at, an rapport de force. Do you guys hear about this term? Rapport is relation and force is power. Power relations. But when you're creating a rapport de force, it, a, a power relation does is a rapport de force can't exist if there's like if there if it's all one way, right? A rapport de force implicitly impl it implies there being two <coughs> at least two different things that are antagonistic. So when we're talking about creating a rapport de force, we're not just talking about creating power relations. We're talking about creating like a creating your your like an autonomous space of resistance, or uh, you're building a space that is antagonistic to something that already exists. So that uh, is what we were, so there, there's this, this transformative justice, the idea, just to be concrete, because I'm kind of going off in, in, in uh, all different directions. To be concrete, the idea that we understood was, you have, I mean, these are steps that are linear that aren't actually linear, but I'm going to lay them out as linear and you guys take it for what it's worth. You have the um, announce, like the denunciation, or like the speaking, the verbalization of the the the, 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 whip, the the saying that this existed. So whether that be in public or private, that is one that is considered as the first step, according to different like people that have written about it. So talking about it, saying it out loud, saying uh, like the survivor. We're coming from the survivor's perspective. This happened to me. This person did this to me. That's the first step. Then. You have the uh, confrontation of the perpetrator. Um, after that, you want to try and create three committees. What? How do I do it? Here? Um, we started with this group, 
only and kind of brought it up to this group. Almost got the potential of these people, like everyone was burnt out. And we're like just picking back up. So that is from November. We like, we didn't know what was going on. We're like research. Then we built this up to here. We published this text. We had a like a public a public meeting to try and talk about what this was. Uh, and in the public meeting, there's some people from here that um, wanted to participate in this, and we didn't, we haven't succeeded in integrating them because this group is like almost, it's also summer, people went away, a lot of people went away, and it's good to take a break. After this is constituted, what is supposed to happen? We need to have an uh, acknowledgement that this actually happened from the perpetrator. Yeah. Uh, this is central committee, and there is an No, you actually want to keep these relatively separate. Yeah. Like what happened was the survivor actually approached their partner and was like, hey, yeah. I'm going through this right now, this is what I want to do. And it's like stuff that is happening anyways. Like, oh, I'm going to support you trying to represent your partner. Yeah. But now I, it, when you make these like little for formalities, it allows you, I, I think that it was helpful for the, this process and not every process did it that formally. But this stuff happens anyways, right? Yeah. One thing that, when you do formalize it, helps is you try to avoid that these two things become the same. Because yeah. that's tough, man. And if, if someone's like, I want to go to his house and break his fucking windows out there and cut his tongue out, like, that is not necessarily something that these people should be hearing. Yeah. Maybe that person, maybe the survivor wants to be in that moment at that time, and that's not necessarily what they want to actually happen here, or that's not going to fly, ultimately. Um, so yeah, so that's why, and I thank you for asking that. And it's tough too, like, this is a tricky space. This, this is ideal, right? Um, yeah. So, we need an acknowledgement of the, of the act of the violence, of what has happened, responsibility being taken, and then, hopefully, uh, what, what you want to have is the conditions of transformation. Oh, sorry. You want to identify the causes of the assault, okay? Are, is your exploitation at work a cause of your violence towards your partner? Is the fact that then yeah, yeah, yeah. There's different causes that we can identify. Are, is your group of friends uh, condoning this kind of, these kinds of attitudes and violence? Is this, then they're, they're, what are the causes? Where are we, where is this coming from? Um, uh, so yeah, trying to find the root causes and then once you identify that, and that has to be something that's done all throughout here, right? And that has to be work that's put in through here. I think one of the regrets that I have is that there wasn't enough work coming from this area. And a lot of the work was coming from this area. That's inevitable, but you can control, like, okay, now we're going to stop, and now you have homework, right? And then, anyway, so that, so you want to find the root causes of, of, the, of the violence. And then you want to find the conditions of transformation. And those are something that we take that has to be, there has to, there has to be a consensus from here to here. The conditions of the transformation are gonna come from, it has to be agreed upon by both parties. I think that transformative justice can happen without this, because this, you know, it's like eight out of 10 perpetrators don't, don't recognize that they did anything wrong. This is like, we're like shooting, like we're up against a lot, like that's bad statistics. But I just don't know if people are actually try and fight that. And I think maybe if we fight it, we can get a better statistic. Anyway, so this is, sometimes your conditions of transformation are not going to involve this person, but that's the ultimate, that's, that's, where, it's, that's where the crux is, right? Um, so you have the acknowledgement, recognition of, the, of violence, root causes, identification of root causes of the violence, and then the conditions of transformation, which can be collective. So if we feel like this, Assaulting someone is responding to a need. That is what someone told me. When you, when you're, that's responding to a need, however messed up that sounds, right? So if, if assault is, a, is taking power and control, is that a compensation for places where there is a lack of control in your life? These are the kinds of things that we have to talk about. Yeah, I said it, you know, I went there. Like, that's crazy to say. And that's hard, especially for like, if this, anyway, if, if, depending on how, 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 what the nature of this, how this person is living it, it can be really tough to go there, but that's like, I think that's the condition of 
the transformation is being able to talk about that. So if we know that this person has had their child taken away from them by the state, and we know that that is coming out in different areas and that might be a source of violence, then one of the conditions of transformation can be that everyone gets together and tries to get this person back their kid. But that has to be agreed upon, not just by this person, but by this person. And if we know that this is, like we have to be able to, we have to be able to talk about these tricky issues, you know? Um, and this is why I started off with the class analysis, because I don't want to go there with someone who is my class mentor. I don't, like there's some people, for me personally, this is just me, uh, that their humanity exists in theory but not in practice for me. And that is just, that's just me being honest. Um, so you have to decide if it's worth it, because that's the kind of reflection that we have to have. And also, like, to be, like, so I just went deep with you guys, because I want to hear you a little bit. But some of, the, some of the other conditions of transformation can be, like, you have to, you're not allowed to go to parties, or you're not allowed to sleep over at people's play, at, at the parties for this amount of time. Or we want you to go to a psychologist and then talk to us about it. And so then you have the follow-up. And the committee can also, and the community can do a follow-up. Enforcing the conditions implies a greater group of people. So you have to have people invested in the enforcement. If we, if we have said that this person is not allowed at this, at this house during these times, and they're there, we don't have the police. We don't have surveillance cameras. We have to have people that are committed to the principles of this success in order for that condition to be respected, which is why it's a collective process necessarily necessarily collective. We are all accountable to people that experience violence because we are all living in the same environment. Um, so yeah, that's like the that is the concrete where we are. Give me give me some questions. Let me let me take some questions. Yeah. Um, so in terms of practice, do these support networks for the survivor and the perpetrators just end up being they're just their friends essentially? Is that the idea? It can be. It can be. Um, or are these like pub side people that are kind of uh, volunteering to make a decision for their external justice purpose? I've seen both. So recently there was a message put out on Alepe de Nisa that someone was like, ah, this is too much. Like, I can't do this. This is like, uh, you know, and I need help. And like, that was a call to Facebook. People that are friends with Alepe de Nisa. That's really, I think that might be really tough for the survivor. Right. So there's no rule about it having to be friends. Right. Ultimately, who is gonna, like hopefully your friends are gonna want to help you through that. Um, and usually when you first say it, it's not in public, it's not on Facebook, it's to a trusted individual. The initiative, the, like this has to, what this, what this, what the survivor needs has to, has to come first in terms of like our limits. So like if the survivor can't go to meeting with the perpetrator, we, we want to react to the fact that and I, I, um, we want to react to the fact that this person was uh, was um, unable to choose, right? That's part of the assault is un being unable to choose. You are you are experiencing the submission of someone else. So we want to respect this person's ability to choose, right? And so as much as possible, as much as possible, you want to really try and respect that person that person's limits that they put. And I'm telling you. This person is not going to ask for like crazy things. Like they're not going to, in general, from my experience, people that are survivors are not going to be like, I want that person banished. It's hard, it's tough, and a lot of the time they're like feeling bad about what happened to them and feeling bad that they hurt the, per the perpetrator. So we, we really want to try and give that power to this person to, what, what we, what, the way we democratically constructed this committee was that uh, it was by consensus unless there was unless there was no ability to make decisions. unless there was like okay we don't we don't we don't agree then we go to majority vote and uh, and the survivor gets the veto so you can't survivor can't oblige anyone to do anything but the survivor can block something that they don't want and that way we're respecting these people's limits as well right she can't be like oh I want you to jump over the mountain and the like, I can she's like you know, so that's not gonna happen in real life. Um, if anything, that's um, yeah, go ahead. Um, so like in the spaces that I organize in, um, I 
been like advised not to use terms like um, survivor, victim, or perpetrator because they can come across as like static. Mm -hmm. um, and have been like steered more towards using terms like um, um, like the person who caused harm, the person who received right. harm. Okay. Um, yeah, like, I, I guess I was just like, wondering why you specifically choose to use like those terms. Like, no, I've never heard that. No one's ever told me about that. Uh, that's cool though. I like that. And I think I think if I you want to explain the principle behind it? Um, yeah. Uh, I guess like I, I organize a lot of like like, um, like people of color spaces only. Um, and like steering away from terms like that, um, or the reason why that happens is because it's like an acknowledgement that um, shit can be actually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, it puts things in a binary. Um, like for instance, like I'm thinking of a scenario of a, a friend of mine who um, um, he was accused of being a sexual, like, like sexually assaulted somebody, not accused, so he sexually assaulted someone, um, but he's a, he's a man of color. Um, and he sexually assaulted um, um, like a white female assigned person. Um, but while that sexual assault occurred, um, there was also an instance of white supremacy, as in like the cops being called uh, like later down the road, and like like cops and police obviously like are uh, a form of like or manifestation of like white supremacy and violence, structural violence. So it's like in order to like steer away from like we started using those terms, and I, I don't know, I guess I was like... Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that, because these are, these, actually, these change, like, anyway, this is tricky, this is tough, it's tough, so and I, that's why I find to also talk about my truth, because my truth is, is coming from this place, where I am here, and when you're here, and here, and you're just like trying to make this here, it's a lot of dichotomy. And that's and that's not necessarily the objective truth, but that's also something that I want to be honest with you about that's where that's where I'm coming from. But I like that because it's, it's different. And on that note, one of the reasons why we wanted to um, why we wanted to do transformative justice is because we reject the tribunals that the state has put for any kind of so-called pretense of justice. And that is also because of our experience. Uh, as like as like radical activists uh, with like criminalization, and that is not that's something that it's not. I don't think it's accidental that like communities of various like black like black feminists have talked about transformative justice. Queer communities have, have like written about this. That's when we were going out. The Philly stands up. They have been writing on transformative justice and like talking about how why we refuse to work with uh, states forms of justice, and that's not. I don't think that transformative justice has to be that way, but that's how we chose to be. We don't, we don't like cops were not an option, right? Um, uh, and that's tough, man. That's tough. That's not easy. And I would never, I would never go against anyone who wanted to use cops. I just feel like in this, in this situation, that's what we chose, and there's different reasons for that. Uh, okay, one, two. Give me, give me, everyone, put up your hand so I can see you. One, that is two. Okay. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Yeah, I have this. I'll do this. You know, like, um, so like, from where I am, I really don't want to re recognize that the legal system about sexual assault is like really not an option. But if you're the people who cause harm,
it's not gonna work if this person doesn't wanna do it. You can try and convince them, you can talk to them about it. Like I don't think it's like fichu, it's not static. Like this person, you can dialogue with them, you can try and talk to them and then have read this. That's something that I have done, because I believe in this, and there's some people that haven't done this, and I really respect that, that's their choice. Uh, but I will talk to them about it and be like, you know, this is what's happening. But ultimately, it doesn't exist. If this person doesn't want to do it with this person, it's not, that's, that's what they do, and there's other stuff. You know? Um, yes, I think uh, I saw. Wait, 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 Uh, it can be 
a reflection of your willingness to put into the transformation. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, so when, when some of the main issues that came out were when the denunciations came out, it was like, who, 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 uh, who was it that is, like, who's the, who's the woman? Who is it that has been accusing? That was a big topic. We want to know who it is and we want to know what happened. Because a lot of the time it was like, this person sexually assaulted a woman. And it was like, you know? Uh, and so you don't know what happened. And that's tough too, because you don't get to judge, right? You just have to take that person's word for it, and that's the test. But that's also, I think, what made this really interesting and important. And then after that, there was other denunciations that happened where people detailed what happened. This is what happened, this is what happened, then this, then this, and then this, and it was here, and it was here, right? So there's both strategies, and that's something that this person gets to decide. But I just feel like it's important for me, what I learned is that we don't oblige someone to, to be abusive. If they want to, that's them. But we don't oblige. When you have the naming, or is it like the, the naming what happened, saying it, it doesn't have to be public. It, ha it can be private. It can be to your best friend. It can be to a complete stranger, right? And that, that is just the act of doing it. And sometimes this happens multiple times before you can go onto this stage. Which is response, response to, which is like, you want this person to take responsibility. Um, to talk about what happened. Where am I at? Okay. Um, so, what, uh, I want to address some critiques. There's a lot of critiques. A lot of people were not happy. Uh, people were saying that when you denounce on Facebook, especially like people who were close to the uh, person who was causing harm, were like in shock, they're like, oh my god, my friend did this. And it was really tough because Facebook is cold in that sense, right? You're not getting that. They're like, why didn't anyone warn us in advance? We wanted to know, right? So, so I'm, I'm speaking in anonymous. You have like this person who was there with this people, right? I'm like, okay, I want to make this public. I want to name this name. I want to call this person out. I want to put it on Facebook. And then people around here are like, you guys can give us a heads up first. Like this is tough for us to hear on Facebook, you know? And that really threw us off. Like you're not gonna let us know. I don't think that, I think that that's something that if you're, if you're supporting a survivor, you can ask. Do you want us to give these people a heads up? And as your role as someone who's gonna be supporting that person or here, that's something that you might wanna think about. Cause I know that the community that I was part of, we didn't think about it. It wasn't that we had consciously decided we want to let these people know or not. It was that we it didn't cross our mind. And when you allow that person to make that choice, then you're acknowledging these critiques that have happened, but still allowing, like, people can't impose how this person wants to break their silence. You know what I mean? This person has to be able to break their silence the way they want. But what you can do is give them a heads up on what might be coming up. The thing I'm really dwelling on is how to make the determination about whether someone's worth investing yeah. in yeah. like the repair of the cost harm. Right. Um, you know, I can easily imagine so many difficulties arising where even the person who was harmed might say they want this process, but there would be many other people uh, within a group that say, well, I mean, even if, even if you want to forgive him, and even if you want to invest time and energy to do this process, I don't feel safe being in the room with this person. Like, like, so if you feel okay with it, you want to forgive, you want to move on, great for you, like, but that's sort of an individual decision. But I don't want to be in the room with, with, with rapists. So, yeah, but you're going to be, well, you're going to be well, And that's their right, but like, let's do that. Everyone knows everyone. Everyone. We all know everyone. You're going to be awful alone. You, don't have to you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. And that's that person's right, but like that, this is what this is all about. Like, this is everywhere. We're, we're in it. I know all the We're born out of violence, man. Sure. Like, Cognies right. everywhere, um, and then we are the you know. Just, I would encourage you to let it be. The survivor herself doesn't realize that because it, it takes them the initial healing 
process time, and then sort out her feelings, understandably. Yep. I have not been in these situations, but I've, you know, Wobeck style have heard about separate instances in which the survivor did want a transformative process, but then other survivors who had been impacted by that very same perpetrator did not. And so the horror was that the survivors themselves started alienating each other. That's what happened. That's right. it. That's like normal. I think, I think yeah. that happens like that's in a mutual respect. That's how this is a sticky situation. And, and then there's an even more sticky situation where um, advocates spoke up on behalf of a survivor for a separate situation, mm -hmm. but in a way that could have been construed as misappropriating the space and voice for that survivor. Mm -hmm. But in militant fashion, perhaps, because the survivor wasn't done healing, what does that mean? Okay. Uh, I, 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 by the way, personally would, would kind of have the tendency to lean towards survivor calls all shots, but I, I guess that's too, it's not even just too extreme, like the survivor might just not be ready yet. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, that's, yeah, I have some more questions. And where were we with someone else? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the process. Yeah, because this is tied to that, where we can I'm writing notes, like I have trouble. I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, you want to, you want to, you want to, you want to save it for after? I'm sorry, I'm not reading it right now. How about we do that for after? Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? Well, yeah. I feel like this is the will separate from the discussion that I'm having right now. That's okay.
right now, I'm stuck at, in my committee, on my personal situation that's going on, we're stuck at this point right here. And I want you guys to know it takes months, sometimes, months, to get this person to be like, oh, I take responsibility, if that ever happens. So this is long term, this is a big deal. Sorry, one last time. I know I'm taking up a lot of speaking, sir. Um, I feel like a lot of what I've talked about in terms of, like, in my spaces with transformative justice is, like, kind of disrupting or, like, throwing a cob in the air of, like, that whole dialogue around building safe spaces. Like, mm, yeah. um, I don't I don't believe in safe spaces. I don't believe in, like, oh, well, okay, my judgment is made by myself. <laughs> <laughs> like, especially for, like, people with intersectional identities, that's, like, never an option. Um, so like when I see, when I talk, when I hear transformative justice, what I think about is um, accountable spaces, like spaces in which people aren't being excluded because like otherwise our groups and like whatever movements would be way too small, but spaces in which we can place like collectively take accountability for like um, the actions and like like structures of violence that are in play um, and transform them to like I don't know, to grow. Can I, I, and I, before I take you to other questions, I want to talk about the fact that uh, the transfer, the conditions for transformation can, can look uh, like a struggle, or it can look like exclusion, or it can look like both. So that's what I think is cool about transformative justice in a revolutionary perspective, if we understand that systemic oppression is one of the causes of the violence that we inflict on each other, then we have to attack the systems of oppression. And so organizing, it, like being involved in in union organizing, you can actually be combating rape culture. Those are not separate from you, right? Like you, you can't just absorb oppression and and like just oh I'm good I'm good I'm just gonna chill with this oppression like that. Those, those are scars. Those are traces. Um, so that is that's it, this is this is a, a, a perspective, a struggle perspective, and that's what we have to deal with our causes. Okay, what I was here. Again. I keep following a lot of their responses and their interviews. It's a good thing in the It's a good thing in the film and in the And it takes many years. Uh, and the person who the premier had to go through therapy, right? It was very efficient. But at the beginning, the person answered by saying, uh, my action was, I'm, I'm not an aggressor. Right. It was specific condition. Right. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm not going to take a call with all those other aggression on the family. That was a bit of that speech, you know? Um, and then eventually what happened is that through the discussion uh, in that group, uh, what was important to me is that the, the guys start to realize, actually, no, I, I, I do I do these things. I have, I added more even. And then realizing a series of microaggression and other aggression, and at the end, coming back to the thing and say, I caused a trauma, and I'm sorry. Um, but at this moment, they could express to us that it, it changed a lot. It, it, and it takes a lot of years, but that just that recognition changed everything. And the person who they were there is, is still trying to manage and realizing that actually, yeah, so we talked about my past, but it's, it's, it's realizing his father was abusing his mother all his life, and then he basically had to be so much guilty. So there's all another level of validation too. So that it wasn't the process I thought the shoe last day, but that stuff happens all the time. Yeah. And we did with small things. Oh wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. There was a third person? Yeah, I think it's wrong. Wait, it's not. Oh yeah, you want to go get your book. Okay. So I'm gonna practice about how to structure this right. Um as or with people who may not be like familiar with this kind of process, how, how would you recommend like forming the the circles and what kind of like what are you searching for in the, the people who are surrounding both the, the people who receive harm and the people who cause harm and the community? Which is the purpose of the community like a mediator? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of different things. The mediator is it can be like logistics, just like where we're meeting, we're meeting, are we gonna have? So this, this committee organized like a public forum where this this is a this, this was written by the committee and this was explained at the public forum. And so they were organizing, booking, and there was 
people here that we're going to find mediators and find, make sure there was a PowerPoint that this person just doesn't worry about, right? Uh, so, and not everyone here went to the public forum, but you want to include, I think it's important not to feel like people don't get it. Really, really, that's something that we can feel like, and it's just not true, it's not true. We have different words, but everyone can swear. I honestly believe that people get it. I really do. Like, I feel like everyday people that aren't in university that aren't, won't be able to define what oppression is, get this, seriously. And I would not be shy to just open your mouth and say that. And I, one of my, my last slide was courage. Because I think courage is, is like the thing that's really touching me right now. It's like a big theme to my life, and I want us to be courageous. I want us to be courageous, and you can't oblige people to be courageous. I mean, you can a little bit. But mostly, you have to lead by example. Right? So I would encourage us to be courageous and, uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. Um, okay. I just wanted to, I think one of the things that has been a critique is like, are you guys wanting revenge or do you want to work with the aggressor? Like, you don't know, you haven't made up your mind. Like, what, like, are you, if, and it, it wasn't a critique of the revenge. The revenge was understood as this, like, very legitimate thing, kind of like, what um, Comrade was saying earlier, like this person wanting revenge is totally legitimate in some circumstances, right? And if, if, if that's what you want to do, then why don't you just do it? Then you should really work with them and not try and do this double thing, right? Because you want to oblige, you want to oblige them to live by conditions that have been decided and agreed upon collectively. So there's an obligation, there's an imposition of will, of a collective will, right? And then you have, on the other hand, um, you have this, this thing where you want to come, you want to have a healing process, you want to have, be able to come to terms, and, and you want to find justice, right? You want to, you're investing in this person, and you're kind of shitting on them, and that's, you know. So how do you balance those two things? And that was the critique, like, you can't do both. I think you can. I think you can, and I think they're necessarily intertwined, which is why uh, healing is an important principle, right? That's one of the things that, the, like, what we did when we sat down, when these committees have sat down, we were like, what are, um, what are our goals? What do we want to achieve? And if you can try and, it's, it's tough to get it out, but that would really help you, like, go back to your goals. Okay, so uh, somebody was uh, recorded, okay? Someone took a tape recorder, sat down with the survivor and recorded the survivor, okay? Without their consent. Sneaky, okay? That happened. Um, someone, what the perpetrator also uh, sent threats of, uh, I'm gonna sue you for a defamation, like a defamation. Um, defamation. Defamation. <laughs> yeah, defamation. And uh, like this is stuff that happens. And if you have the goals in mind, you're like, okay, so when I'm, I know my goal, and I know what's happening here that's preventing me from getting to my goal, how much energy I'm gonna put into this? Is this like a distraction from my goal, or is this, do I have the necessary components to get to my goal? It, like survivors that have been accused of being pathological liars. Maybe, and that's like not this, the case that I was part of, that's another situation. Is that really, is that an important factor? Do we care? Do you think that pathological liars don't get assaulted? Are pathical, pathological liars, let's say that this person is a pathological liar, does that mean that they're lying about their assault? Right? Do we care, do you think that it's less hard for a survivor of violence who is a pathological liar to break the silence? Is that less hard because they're a pathological liar? I don't think so. I think it's pretty much the same thing. You're gonna deal with a lot of stuff, right? So when you keep your goals in your mind and in your like in your vision, try and come back to them, then it allows you to move forward. And one of the reasons why this is on a hiatus right now is because I think people needed the time to heal. Because when you're pushing forward, you're pushing forward, you're pushing forward, you're making compromises, you're trying to create lines of communication. Uh, it's tough, you know? And then taking a step back and healing it, we are we're all working within the constraints that we have. Uh, so yeah, dichotomy. <laughs> dichotomy. Uh, that's it. Uh, conditions of transformation. What else? Yeah. So 
healing, revenge, and it happened with the phone. Working with the person, not wanting to work with the person, you're working with the person so that you can figure out how you're not going to work together. That might be what transformative justice looks like for someone, you know? Yes, yes. Ah, oui, il y a des. autonomous people were like on their own you know survivors like not contacting anyone so people were like I don't want that guy to party right and so he was feeling the consequences and so one thing is like uh, damage control is a big thing like oh my god keep my reputation losing power is super tough and I don't know how many times I've really been in a position to lose to be forced to lose my power and I'm sure I wouldn't react that well you know like it's tough and if it's not tough then it might not be real um, So, uh, having having that like outside, like the implication of people here, and like and also just when you when you can't constitute this, and you you have this is something that the oppressors will not understand. So there is like a power in breaking that silence, right? Um, there is a power there that can be. I don't. I think it's important not to underestimate it. It takes a lot of. It's risky, and one thing that's never going to happen is ultimate justice. It's not going to happen. We just want something better than what we have now. But like, the responsibility is going to be on this person. The person who's suffering is going to still suffer the most. And the work is going to come from this group more than this, always. But we can try and balance that out as much as possible. We can try and make the best of what we have. Listen to her song, thank you. Yeah, so uh, one thing was mentioned earlier about like, uh, do we want to have great is Uh, in that our we, we need like to work with rapists uh, uh, in general people causing harm. Uh, one thing that I would like to, to uh, submit is that if your goal, your potential goal, goal is to have like revolution, mm -hmm. if you're working towards revolution, uh, you can't just expect like to exclude rapists because they're gonna end up in another group, they're gonna end up in society. And they're still gonna cause harm. They're not like maybe they won't cause harm inside our movement, but like if our goal is to change society, obviously we can't just exclude people from our movement and expect them like to like stop causing harm because they're suddenly exclude. 
exclude the term R movement. So I believe that if your, your goal is to work like towards revolution, that's one step. Like you have to make sure that people stop being racist, stop causing harm, like not just exclude them. One of the things that was mentioned is like when we exclude, and I, I think it, I think people have every right to want to exclude. If I should be yeah, yeah. like if someone wants to exclude, then we that like so be it. Like this stuff is not we. This stuff we're taking direction from people that we don't know that are like abstract, right? So when we what we want is also dependent on what that person is asking for, or it's a group. Um, but. Uh, yeah. So exclusion is definitely something that can potentially happen, and I respect that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but ultimately, the um, yeah, the, the, the cross analysis can allow you to figure out how you want to, if you want to live with this person. Some people don't have a choice but to live with that person. You're stuck with that person. Maybe you wish they could be excluded, but they can't. Or maybe your half of the fox isn't big enough. So maybe you're making compromises here, right? You're like this isn't perfect. And so if you have to make compromises, how are you going to make the best of it?
source is from which power generates. So even if someone has a really high rank, there are other ways through organization that we can actually bring down this or uh, break the balance of power emissions. So, Uh, yeah, just as a note, like, because this is a sensitive topic, I'm trained in active listening, so if anyone wants to chat later, tap me on the shoulder, we can take a walk. Um, and I'd just like to, to echo, like, particularly the comment, oh, the comrade left, but the, the comment about accountable spaces and what, what the comrade down here like, said about, like, actually waging revolution, what, what that involves, and, like, um, having those accountable spaces, like, these are not uninfiltratable spaces, like, nothing that we do is, like, a supreme form of safety, and, like, the question really comes, like, of, of whether or not someone's worth it really comes down to, like, the work that they're willing to put in, as well as, like, what the, the survivor or someone who's receiving the violence wants, and, like, that, that for me is, like, the, the final break, is, like, whether or not that transformative justice can happen. I just want to thank you for this up. I know it's going to uh, help me a lot here. Um, we uh, have been since uh, our sexual assault in the US and Ottawa, and so what I had to do was when it happened, totally on the to deal with it. I was in a position of leadership at the time. Um, and uh, I, I think, like, had I seen this presentation earlier in the half, I would have been looking at the world wide law and the same thing. We were lucky in the sense that we were really happy to launch great clips of trust the survivor, uh, to default to the survivor and start to model of moving forward. Um, the perpetrator, uh, the director of cause harm, didn't deny it and agreed to undergo such a process, but then the question was, what kind of process do we going to take? What do we do? Um, and so, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else?
You know what I mean? And she, they gave her the opportunity to be like, no, I don't want you to do that. She didn't say, I want you to go fuck up the shit. Right? She didn't say, she didn't take that initiative. But when people wanted to, they asked her and she said, I don't care if you do. Okay? So what's going on here is not necessarily what everyone else is doing. Say there's people that have been like, oh, do you think I should come back to a leadership position on the student union? And there have been people that are like, no, I don't think you should have. That person that was like, I don't think you should have, she is not connected to survivors. She doesn't know the survivor. So there's other kinds of punishment that can happen, punishment, and there's other kinds of constraints that, that can happen outside of just this process. Hopefully, if we can create a culture of solidarity. Um, and I think it's important to define, define consent. What we, we, that's what we did. The definitions are super important. What is a sexual assault? Sexual assault is the not, no respect, the not respecting consent of one or more than one person in a sexual act. What is consent? Consent. Consent is uh, it's, it's similar to the free and informed prior consent and continued consent. I'm not a fan of the enthusiastic yet because I don't think that, I don't want to, anyway, I think enthusiastic is like, honest, like it's not very sexy. Well, above and beyond that, it's like, Above and beyond it not being sexy, it's like sometimes we do sexual things for people not because we're enthusiastic, but because we want to. I might not be turned on, but I might want to do something sexual with you. And that's what I, and me being able to choose that is important. So you being like, oh, you're not enthusiastic, I don't know. Like, no, I'm sad, but I want to do this for you right now. I want to engage. So the enthusiasm is like imposing an emotional state on someone that I don't think is always realistic. Um, so I like the, the, the and it's tough, consent is tough, it's like continued consent. So you wanna, and I think generally when you talk about continued, we want, you're also talking about if the intensity goes, if the intensity of the sexual act is changing, that might be a good time to check in about is this, is the consent still here, right? Like if the, if the nature is changing, and that, those, those are cues, because it's like, what are you doing, like, kissing and saying yes all the time, like that's awesome. <laughs> so, and I'm free. At, free is like, you know, you don't have a gun to my head. Uh, like, oh, you consent, right? That's not free. Um, and uh, prior is also being honest about intentions. You know, and um, so those are the kinds of things that we use to define consent. And using that definition has allowed us to talk about what is and isn't sexual self. And that's really important. That's like a foundation. Because it's not everyone has the same definition, but we have to be able to define. If we want to have a conversation and I want to say, okay, but the consent was there, no, the consent wasn't there. This is my definition of consent according to this definition, which I believe as the objective truth, that like this consent was not respected. And so now you're talking about my definitions and you're on my terms. I'm not going to debate you and your versions of consent. You're going to talk about me and my version of consent. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, lastly, I would like to let you guys know that I am this person, and my assaulter's name is Ida. So you never know. You never know. You don't know who you're dealing with. Just keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you, guys.
2012 trial. Um, the, I, I don't know exactly how much time it will take. Maybe it's going to be way shorter than an hour and a half, maybe longer. Uh, but I, I thought it would be longer. Uh, I want you to ask questions as soon as you ask them so that we can answer. Because many of what I'm going to talk is how we work uh, to organize general assemblies, uh, how we work in uh, meetings in Quebec. But if you want to share like tricks you have to organize meetings, it can be helpful for everyone. And um, if you have specific questions on how we work, because sometimes uh, I think uh, ways of organizing our assemblies as granted, and it might not be clear for anyone. So if you have questions, please just raise your hand. We'll answer it right away. Um, so uh, the goal of this workshop uh, is to talk about uh, direct democracy and organize the, the organization of meetings. Uh, I'm going to talk from my perspective in Quebec, so I'm going to use a lot of examples of our student union to work here. Uh, but as I said earlier, this is uh, one way of working. There, there might be different ways that can work correctly as well, so uh, you can share it uh, whenever you want. So, um, I tried to, uh, to separate the, the kinds of meetings that we have uh, to explain how different size and different uh, bodies of people that gather uh, make the meeting work different. And it's not clear right now, I'm going to explain. Uh, there are three different types of meetings. Uh, there are mass meetings that are uh, open to all, that are heterogeneous groups. Can we say that? Heterogeneous? Yeah groups of people that don't really agree. And uh, these meetings uh, can be difficult to organize because they are open to all and everybody, even if they disagree, can come to the meeting. Distinction because the procedures we use in the direct democracy structures for each of these meetings are not the same. Um, uh, uh, who here was there at the, the conference I gave like yesterday? So, so for those of you who weren't there, I, I will wrap up a little bit the way the student unions are structured just to make everything clear about which meetings and what. Um, in a student union in Quebec, the General Assembly is the supreme uh, uh, institution of the, of the student union. The, the decision of the, the, the General Assembly cannot be uh, overruled by any other meeting than another General Assembly. Uh, the Executive Council is a group of elected people that make sure the day-to-day -day operation uh, is going fine and that only operates inside the motions that are voted in the General Assembly. So they cannot, like, I don't know, if the, if the Executive co uh, Committee decides to go on a campaign for a free vision, uh, it cannot decide on itself to like uh, begin creating posters and uh, that kind of stuff if the General Assembly didn't vote for it. Uh, but if the General Assembly votes for a campaign on prevention, then the uh, Executive Committee can do organizing work to prepare posters, the flyers, even though the General Assembly didn't specify that they wanted to have two posters and five flyers. For it. Uh, and the mobilization committee uh, uh, is an important structure because it's an open structure to everyone who wants to work within a campaign uh, of uh, student union. So, for example, if the, the, the General Assembly decided to, uh, to make a campaign of prevention, uh, the executive will have to do the campaign, but it can organize a mobilization committee so that everyone that wants to get involved in the campaign can go. And this place an important, uh, uh, an important uh, space where uh, you can uh, gather more people and involve more people uh, in the process of like uh, the escalation of tactics and getting the work out. Is that clear for the way to continue about structures in Quebec? Um, uh, I talked about that because uh, 
Yeah, so we'll talk a bit about how the, the goal of each of these structures and how you can how we organize them so that they can fulfill their specific goals. Um, when we talk about the General Assembly, the General Assembly is what builds the legitimacy of the old campaign. It is what builds the legitimacy of the tactics, that's what builds the legitimacy of the demands. And that's the, the base on which a movement can uh, go broader and can become a mass movement. Um, the, but the, the General Assembly, uh, because it, it's open to all the members of a student union, for example, I don't know, if you have a, a, a social science student union, for example, all students in social science can go to the General Assembly, even though they don't agree uh, with previous uh, votes that were taken in the Assembly. So if the, the, the Assembly is on going for a campaign of subscription, uh, somebody that opposes subscription can go in the General Assembly and will oppose the motion, of course. So it, the, the, the people in the General Assembly are a peer group. Can somebody just tell me how to pronounce it? Heterogeneous. 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 So it's like heterogeneous. Heterogeneous. <laughs> okay, so people are heterogeneous inside the assembly. And um, this is a good thing because uh, what builds the legitimacy of the General Assembly is that everybody can go there and the, even people who oppose, as, who oppose what's voted there as a chance to speak, as a chance to explain why, and if it loses its vote, well, it builds the legitimacy of the majority in the assembly. Uh, but this is also why, because it is heterogeneous, uh, the, the procedure we use in the General Assembly uh, usually work on simple majority votes. Uh, we don't wait to have like two-third majority or unanimous consensus uh, to go on a campaign because like in a 2,000 uh, student, uh, 2,000 member student union, uh, you could never get consensus on a specific campaign. There's, especially in universities where uh, part of the students that are there are right-wing or conservatives and or have like bourgeois family and don't, and don't share at all the kind of the same interests that others uh, it will be hard to get consensus with those people. Um, also, uh, the, the, because there is heterogeneity, heterogeneity, can we say that? Word? Yeah, because there is heterogeneity in the General Assembly, uh, it's important that the procedures, when we use them, uh, that they are equal for everyone. And so, to make sure the pro that everyone is equal in front of the procedures, these procedures need to be clear, simple, but need to be strictly applied. So we have like, uh, we are our own version of like, I don't know if you know our school of order or, or uh, or that. And usually those procedural codes are very complex. It's like old books, and then it's not clear how you apply them, and from assemblies that I saw that were running on those codes, usually uh, the uh, the chairperson, can you see that? The chairperson, yeah. Uh, I have like a degree of arbitrarity in how they apply the rules. And this is true also for more informal meetings, where there, when there is no clear procedural code. Uh, and this gives the impression for somebody that is new to uh, the the General Assembly it gives the impression that they cannot control it. It's not like something they can have a grasp on. But if the, there is a clear, short, short uh, procedural code, it's easy for anyone to read it, to understand it, and then to work with it. Um, so we have our own version. It's like a 10 page, something like that, with clear articles. And usually you can. Uh, Summarize it in like a page and a half. That that's the the one we use in you can uh, 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 five or six years. And 
Great. You, yeah, so it's translated on the I don't know if there's a translated version somewhere. Can we find it online? Well, uh, we can find it in French. Yeah. Uh, I know that the part, uh, Fine Art Student Association from Concordia were working on translated translated to it. Because they want to use it in their own opinions and it's a language speaking opinion. But uh, if you can find it, uh, oh, you found it? So you found it? Your edition? Yeah, so that is quite available. Okay. Um, what I wanted to say. Oh yeah, so uh, usually what we try to do is that the chair person, the person that animates the assembly, doesn't add a, a coordinate flow uh, in the, the direction of the assembly. Uh, and we, we try to use someone that is not a member of the student union, so it's, it's somebody from outside uh, that won't, and it, that person doesn't have the right to speak uh, on the topics. It, it's, it's like a judge that just like tries to apply uh, but this uh, needs a, a, a level of organization that is a little uh, higher than like more informal meeting. So this means uh, people in the assembly need to take into account by themselves of the time the debates are taking, um, uh, if, the, if the, the chairperson is really do, uh, applying well the procedural code and that kind of stuff. Um, the, in a general assembly, because the general assembly is like a, a, a large meeting, um, and because obtaining a lot of people involved in the general, general assembly uh, necessitates doing work and mobilization, uh, you cannot hold general assembly all the time. Uh, in Quebec, student unions hold general assembly something like twice a semester. Uh, this and a general assembly is uh, in, when there are questions, semester in a normal period, I don't talk about strike period or strike general assemblies, uh, usually last something like an hour and a half or two hours. So when you have 50 or 60 people in the room for an hour and a half, uh, you cannot debate on, on a lot of stuff. You need to concentrate on a few important points, so you need to prioritize uh, the topics. Uh, and this uh, is why uh, executives in student union in Quebec have a, an important role in uh, preparing the general assemblies, making sure uh, uh, there are already propositions that are uh, on the table, uh, but making sure also to uh, send uh, frequent information to the members so that between the general assembly they know what's going on and they are uh, prepared when they arrive at the general assembly. Um, and during the general assembly, because you cannot discuss on like uh, a ton of topic and you need to concentrate on a few things, the proposition that, or the motion, can you use the proposition? So the, the proposition that are discussed uh, cannot be like too detailed. And uh, so, for example, if you want to organize a product and the general assembly uh, uh, is in front of uh, organizing a product motion, if the, if the motion includes like the, the specific date, the root of the protest, and like all details, and like who's going to be responsible for the, the protest and the, the making the media, uh, it can end in like uh, endless debates because everyone kind of is going to want to like uh, uh, modify the motion. So it's better to concentrate on simple motions. So we're going to organize a protest on that day for that issue, end of the line. And then if the General Assembly is agreed, after that, it's going to be the responsibility of the Executive Council and the, the Mobilization Committee to make sure that happens. Uh, and uh, when we talk about the Executive Council, of course, it's a smaller group of elected people. Uh, but direct democracy 
C can live as long as this group is accountable to the General Assembly. As long as the information between this group and like other stuff that's going on in the, the student union is communicated between the executive and the and the, the broader members. Do you have a question? It's, um, um, in terms of communication, I, I heard that you have you have a mailing system called Vasi So uh, that's how you actually feed all this kind of information from very low level individually and then to general assembly and then to Vasi. Uh, would, would you have time later on to talk a little bit about it? I, I can talk a little bit about it. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about 
about the mobilization question, and then it, maybe you can add a little bit. Um, the, in the two opinions, like with the structure of the General Assembly, the executive, executive council, the people that are elected on the executive council usually take on their, on their shoulders a lot of stuff. And because they are elected and because like the executive council usually meets like once a week and discuss like a lot of stuff going on like on the day to day operations. Uh, but for the fun parts, like for like organizing the political campaign, usually that stuff is done in the mobilization committee. Uh, and that's where the multiple uh, subcommittee will usually appear. Because in the in the mobilization committee, because it Mobilization committee works more on a mechanical basis, and in the sense that uh, you go to the mobilization committee because you want to work on the, the campaign. So you arrive there, and everybody already agrees on I don't know uh, fighting against a certain nature or anything. So they already agree on something. But then, like a group of people at the society of uh, doing a flash mob, and just the other groups uh, want to concentrate on the uh, classes to classes, uh, speeches, and another group uh, wants to do a social media thing. Uh, and when you're in the mobilization committee, because you want to involve everyone, even if like an, a, a group of three people arrives with an idea that sounds awkward or uh, unproductive, because they want to do it, it there's very little point in trying to uh, constrain them to not do what they want to do because they want to put efforts and in doing so. The mobilization committee is because you want to include as much people as possible, you can say, well, you want to work like that, uh, let's create a subcommittee on that subject and you can like, work on it. Uh, as long as the, the, the projects are not going against like the general movement of what the general assembly decided. Uh, uh, but usually what happens is that, uh, that there's a, a natural process of eliminating uh, uh, projects that you have less people that want to work on because it got, the subcommittee has difficulty of like uh, uh, meeting and like uh, uh, working on the project because there are too few. And this creates like a, a natural uh, uh, concentration on priority projects, and by like uh, by the, this way of prioritizing projects, you manage to like get a, a smaller number of committees. Uh, but I don't know if this answers your question. It does. It does. Yeah. And uh, maybe a thing. I've been involved in like organizations that were not student unions, uh, where, for example, I've been involved in the uh, uh, NPG20 protest uh, in Toronto, and we had like this uh, uh, convergence against the G20 that we're organizing in Montreal. So the, the general assemblies there were just like general meetings of affinity of people already sharing the affinity of. Uh, in the G20, and of course, in that kind of thing, when you uh, you create all sort of committee because there's like a, the the committee on posters and the committee on uh, on like uh, putting the posters in the street, and the committee of uh, organizing the mailing list so that we can all communicate, and those all that kind of committee. In the student unions, uh, usually the executives have. Uh, their role, so there is there is like somebody that is elected for and the information like poster that somebody elected uh, to uh, be treasurer and uh, this can help focus the some bureaucratic tasks on specific people that are elected for it and uh, how do we say can we discharge uh, the the responsibility of these tasks from more open committees that can concentrate on political work. Uh, and this can like, uh, be easier on like, our the self organization Does that help? Right? Um, 
So I already talked a little bit about the committee meeting, the organization committee, but that's the, what I wanted to say with the like, mobilization committee is that uh, because the mobilization committee is longer, like you have more time and more, the less people usually, like, the, the more people we want to get, the less time we have to everyone together, like 14 teams that we do. The mobilization committee is a better place even though you don't have a formal vote in the organization committee to like say uh, this project is bad, this one is good, because well, at the end people willing to work on the project and do so. Uh, but it, it's a great place to exchange on the, these projects. Um, and uh, for the member of uh, the executive or for how an elected group Works in direct democracy. Uh, the the elected meeting has the characteristic of being a small group, a small group that can meet often and have long meetings if necessary. But it is also a group that can be a heterogeneous, heterogeneous, heterogeneous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a small group that has the, the, the characteristic of being heterogeneous. And because it, it is heterogeneous, this small group doesn't have to find a consensus because while well, different people can have can can be elected on this, and maybe sometimes it's like opposing faction of the general assembly that elected them, so uh, they can take votes uh, inside the, the, the executive. They can have big debates, and if the the, the debate is like too uh, too political, it's a good thing to bring back the debate in the general assembly. Um, but as I already said, uh, one of the most important things is that the work of the executive council is transparent to the, to the members. Uh, so this means that even though if the executive is a small group, it can be open to members. Like people, the, 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 the meetings of the executive council can be uh, public in the sense that people can come. Uh, in Quebec, it's really rare that people actually come in executive because it's really boring meeting. <laughs> uh, and like I said, there might be tension and there might be people disagreeing and things, but in my experience people were disagreeing on like ridiculously small issues. Uh, but sometimes it's big issues, but when that's just the case, well we go back to the um, yes. Uh, there was questions about uh, the SEC part and the, the, the mailing list. Uh, in in uh, the well-established student union usually manage to get access to some kind of email communication with the members. Uh, this is uh, usually done by building leverage against the administration and when the administration uh, is pressed, well, it, gives them access to a mailing list and contact uh, every member. Sometimes it's a restricted access. For example, there are some CGEP where the student unions can send like three emails per semester. Uh, but like in UCAM Air, most student unions have unlimited access to sending emails so they can send weekly letters uh, to everyone uh, that are part of the student union. Uh, and usually that case is uh, a website. But of course, nothing beats uh, uh, direct communication. Uh, one of the best ways to spread out the word uh, is to go in classrooms and talk about what's happening in the direct the classroom. Uh, some student unions, like the one at the undergrad uh, uh, political science, uh, has a, it, it's like a 700 member student union. Uh, there are eight elected uh, executives, but there are eight elected uh, student representatives, and those uh, elected people, their role is to have just many people involved in the decision process making that are in classrooms and that can like speak in the class and say, also uh, this week that's what happened. Uh, uh, and because there are 16 elected people for 700 uh, members, well, it's easy to put out the world. Uh, but uh, on 
larger unions, for example, the, the political science and law students union, that is 2,000 members, which I was uh, an executive. Um, what we were organizing mobilization committee, and the mobilization committee planned uh, like twice a semester, uh, uh, I don't know if it's like a class tour, can you say that? Like going from classes to classes. And what we will do is uh, make sure, especially like our friendly teachers, make sure that they didn't mind uh, that you like, just come knocking at the door and like, do a five minutes speech and then get a room. Yeah. And that was pretty efficient to spread out the word. Um, I would want to talk, but well, maybe is there a question that there's one? There's not many questions.
There is no simple answer to that because it is true that when there are no formal rules, it's easy for like infinite people to take over the game. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, I did. Uh, I've been a facilitator in many mobilization committees, uh, and uh, usually what we were trying to do is uh, like try to keep the decision making uh, low in the sense that. Uh, like I said uh, uh, later, is that uh, for example, if somebody wants to uh, do a specific project like uh, uh, building a statue. Uh, can you see that statue? Yeah, statue. Yeah. It's like a more French <laughs> statue uh, uh, of something uh, in, in, uh, in paper. And everybody thinks it's a strange idea. Uh, well, we don't have to say we agree with this, but uh, yeah, I don't have simple solutions for this uh, because it's true that it happens. Uh, but if you have two formal procedures and like more uh, in in play in meetings that you want to include people, it can really turn that on. Yeah. Uh, especially when you're like in a brainstorming process of like finding projects and that kind of stuff. This you to say. So the plenary is closed, we need to go to a proposition and then I go, who, who seconds and uh, no, we cannot talk about that or the proposition, that can be really lame for something. Mm -hmm. Somebody who, who just wanted to say, hey, I have this idea of, like, you could do a meme about that and if they just wanted to say it and it's a good thing that the, the meme can be helpful. For example, I'm going to give an example, uh, the, the red square thing, after I thought it was a lame idea. <laughs> And then try to put things in the bylaws that 
courses, more transparency, more accountability. Uh, you can put in the ballot things like we need a bi-weekly email or uh, things like uh, minutes from the executive needs to be public within the next two weeks. That are the kind of things that can be done. Thank you. 
Is that something that you have to No. You both say that lender goes to Uh, 
but of course, if you can't win that, there are, there are like other ways to organize. Uh, for example, the, the strength of the student movement in Quebec uh, resides on uh, a part of the campuses that are uh, mobilized in that. But of course, there is a part of the campuses that are uh, controlled by the right wing. But you don't need all of the campuses to win a strike. Uh, when we talk of the 2012 student strike, at the, at the peak there were 200,000 students on an unlimited general strike. But 200,000 students in post-secondary education, that's about half of the students in the province of Quebec. Well, it's a lot, but it's not all of them. So, so of course there are some student unions where you just can't convince students to join us. I think that you have to try, but at, at some point it's your decision about where it's more important to spend your energy. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and, mm -hmm. Were there other questions there? Uh, I have found them more. Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering like, how, um, like, like pre mobilization means, like, how many, what's a good amount of numbers to get out from meetings? Because obviously those were very important when you want to involve as many people as possible. Uh, it depends. It really depends. On the uh, campus, CEGEP campus uh, are from 3,000 to 6,000 students approximately. Uh, mobilization committee can be like 10, 15 people. Uh, from what I've seen in US campuses, often like the, the affinity groups that were trying to build something were about the size of our mobilization committee. So there are not a lot more people involved uh, in Quebec. Uh, I think the difference is that, that there are like some permanent structures that help the organization uh, and our uh, uh, cultural tactics like the strike that we don't have to build from scratch. Uh, but in the end there are not like that many more people. Uh, who are, who are, yeah, I uh, so, in terms of the supervisors that in fact, it sounds like a lot of the outcome is focused on the strikes as like the main resistance tactic, and the outcome that just everything else goes towards. And I'm wondering if, um, I'm wondering if there's any balance
organizers who started it were trying to get to Tallahassee building. So it's worth a long preamble, but now do you, <laughs> do you have any suggestions on how to introduce more radical tactics in a new organization or in the outside of the student association? And how do you keep general assemblies relevant and manageable so that we're not overloading the work and we're also keeping people engaged? Um, second question is going to be easier to answer. So I, I think there is no exact science on how many general assemblies but uh, I think you've got the right, right word because you said um, relevant. Um, uh, direct democracy lives as long as people have, feel they have power over what's decided, but also as long as what they have decided becomes reality. Uh, if, you dis if you vote uh, a lot of things, but none of those things get uh, realized, well, the, the General Assembly steps. Meaningful, well, any meaning, it doesn't have a purpose. Uh, uh, yeah. In the normal year, I found out that the, I don't know if the semesters there are the same elsewhere, uh, sometimes it's the, the, the school calendar is different from one place to the other, but here we have a, a spring semester of 15 weeks and a winter semester of 15 weeks. Then there is a summer semester but there's nobody in campus. Then it's going to be in the territory. So we have like two 15 week semesters, and usually there is a, a first general assembly for like bureaucratic check and elections and planning and that stuff, and a second general assembly in, uh, uh, in, in, in autumn, uh, uh, like around October or something like that, where we vote like for the, the, the year's campaign or something like that, political. And, and, and then mobilization begins uh, with a uh, gen January uh, assembly where you can go for the political stuff and maybe vote uh, for a protest or a strike general assembly. And then you do the work and then you, we have uh, maybe a, a general assembly by the end of February or the beginning of March where we vote like for strike or uh, for next year's thing. Which And in between the general assembly, we keep people involved in mobilization. Is, is that the good answer? Absolutely. I think what we're missing from ours, and I thought this when we talked about today, was mobilization. We had not mobilization meeting, that wasn't something we had gone with. So, like, we had it informally, right? We had planning meetings and stuff, but we didn't really understand the structure. So, that's mm -hmm. very helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you ever have some of the mobilization team work in the general assemblies, as well as also in the community setting? Yeah. <coughs> Especially, you don't want the general assembly to be to be a work meeting. You don't want people to start saying, "Oh, I can do this and I can do this." And like start the work of the general assembly. It's better to keep it separate. Uh, there was another question. Was I'm going to ask her. I don't want to come back because it's a more complicated one. Have you personally Strike 
uh, that we do almost every year is kind of a mitigating <coughs> procedure to why general assemblies are important, why they have power, and to the tactic of the strike in itself. And the unlimited general strike, we have almost, it's almost mathematic, there's one like every five to seven years, uh, is a, a, a way that the, the tactic is reproduced uh, uh, through the years, and the, the students become radicalized in the process of going to the General Assembly, voting for tactics, trying those tactics. Those tactics fail, they always fail. When you do a petition, it doesn't work. When you, uh, when you do a flash mob, it doesn't work, but it's so appealing at the beginning to make a flash mob. It, it sounds trendy and cool. <laughs> uh, and then failure over failure, these people are getting radicalized. The 2012 strike was built in a two years escalation of tactics. And we began with really boring stuff. Uh, I was part of the 2005 strike, so when we began the work in 2010, uh, I knew that for two years we were doing meaningless tactics. Like, I was pretty convinced of it. Uh, but we needed to do them to get people involved in the process. Uh, so I think that ensures that, that answers also the question of radicalizing. And it's, a, it's important to first say that the escalation of tactics thing cannot be done like in a, it cannot be like a, an overseeing committee that like plans the escalation of tactics every day in two years in advance because for the escalation of tactics to work as a radicalizing process, people need to get involved in the decision process of voting the tactics. But inevitably, the first tactics that are going to uh, emerge from the General Assembly are going to be petitions, uh, sending letters, uh, doing flash mobs, uh, doing silent protests, uh, doing artistic stuff. And all of these can be useful because, well, it increases visibility and that kind of stuff. Uh, and at some point, people will be willing to take a step more. And so, and I have seen the radicalizing pro process uh, that was way further than I have seen from anything during the 2012 strike. Uh, because as the strike was getting longer, people were not only become, were, not only became more radicalized uh, and like, I want to do strikes and I want pre-education. They were becoming like anarchists and communists because they lived the repression of the state on a day-to-day basis. They, they lived the, the, they, they felt the, the, the absence of democracy. They, 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 they felt the uh, arrogance of the government and they were saying like, this system is crap. And they, and, and they were talking together with each other each day and they were talking politics for like six months. And that is way more efficient than any fire. <laughs> uh, I saw a question from him. Yeah. Um, so, for something like the University Auto that I think hasn't even had a first general assembly yet, do um, you think it's worth it to have like, a more like, controversial voting proposal, like a one day strike, um, to like, bring in people, or do you think that start off with like, smaller things? Can you repeat that? <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so like for a smaller university, or not smaller university, but for a university like Ottawa, which hasn't had a general assembly yet, would it be like a good idea to have a more controversial motion, like maybe not the first, but maybe the second general assembly for like a one-day strike, um, bringing people, even though it might be like just be shot down at the general assembly, or do you think it would be better to start off like smaller things? Controversial emotions are a good idea, but uh, I think your GA in your research was for the old campus, right? I will uh, strongly advise against the strike vote on the old campus because even if you manage to win the vote, you will not be able to enforce the strike. And that kill, can kill down the, the legitimacy of the GA in itself. Uh, yeah. But like if you do, I don't know if you say it. But decide the controversial motion and be sure that everybody knows it's going to come and try to convince people on the one-to-one -one basis of the motion. So that, 
that is a good idea to promote the one of the first ones.
there is somebody that you want to touch on that? I wanted the first general assembly 
uh, you might want to put a controversial uh, motion that will help us to go further afterwards. Uh, uh, unless your plan is to try to make the Soviet Union an anti-capitalist one, so that you can like use the funding to uh, do revolutionary stuff, uh, which can be good, but I, I'm not sure if you're there uh, at this point. Uh, yeah, so, yeah like, this would be like it just one or two units, one obviously one or two units, but it would just be like a, a mechanism to encourage participation. Yeah, but so, what I say is that it's better to encourage participation with uh, something that is uh, controlled or something, but that will be useful afterwards, that you, you will be able to use. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have concrete ideas to go from. I don't know what the situation uh, of the campus is. Uh, but something that, uh, for example, mandates the executive to work on a specific thing, that specific thing is If you can mandate to work on a specific thing, and that specific thing is controversial, but you want them to work on that anyway, that's a good idea. And uh, it was yeah. um, I was wondering if you knew of any student unions that operated rather than sort of this general assembly model, do something more like a spokes council, where you have sort of, um, I, I guess we're kind of coming back to but when you have like different groups affiliating into the student union um, and then are moving sort of consensus or something of the sort of union that we're doing within those spokes and then adding like spoke to the more spoke to the cities in the larger group. I guess the reason I ask is on our campus, I go to Portland State, which is like mostly a large community school. And so most of the students that are active on campus are already part of student groups or have some sort of affinity, whether that be like departmental or social or um, they're part of like a cultural environment. And so you know, this is like my group, so then just a plan that um, that would be like a possible model for directly democratic communism, but I just don't know if this is somewhere already. What I've seen uh, organizing general assembly were usually just plain simpler than trying to coalize uh, smaller groups and like trying to make it a part of something like the college council. Uh, many student unions, especially in college, have uh, inside the student unions are clubs, like uh, yeah, all kinds of stuff. And those clubs have usually something like this called council. But this council uh, usually doesn't work on a consensus model, and they usually uh, don't take a lot of space in the political process. It's usually something like, this. hey, uh, uh, I don't know, the budget committee is just 12,000 this year, and there's a new committee, we acknowledge it, we give it space, or hey, our committee is in a small group, we want a bigger group, the other one is almost empty, yeah, I mean, we have, we have something like that already. Um, I guess it's not explicitly political, it's part of the student committee and it's sort of student government. So it basically just allocates funds to some of So our own table works the same way. So, but yeah. instead, it's in the student union, and the General Assembly uh, can overrule it. The General Assembly can say, no, we don't have to want the conservative club in our student union. It's five seven. I think it was supposed to end at five. Um, I had maybe a little thing on preparing meetings, but if you want to leave, you well, we can end it there. Uh,
talked about the general assembly procedures more, but there's another thing on that, I think, later this weekend, that's going to be like a simulation of a general assembly. So uh, I think I'll just end it this and this there. Yeah.